my lovely, lovely imps, thank you for being here today. Today, we are going to be diving into yet another one of my world famous uh, drama mamas. Actually, uh, I shouldn't even wink at that because the truth is I do have viewers all over the world. Drama Mama is the show where I take a online drama usually. Uh, sometimes they broach into, you know, I mean, all online dramas reach into the real world, but some of them are more real world focused. And I basically go from square run and make sure that you are up to date so that you aren't out of the loop on some of the wild dramas uh, that are, uh, that, 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 pro you know, that, that, uh, propagate online. Uh, uh, today's drama is a particularly unique one. Today we are going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons. Um, most people are familiar with Dungeons and Dragons in one way or another, even if you haven't played it yourself. Though, uh, in recent years, Dungeons and Dragons has become, uh, a staple of, of American society. Uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons has reached a level of popularity the likes of which no one had ever been able to predict. When Dungeons and Dragons was first created, it was a extremely niche uh, role-playing game that was largely played by uh, what some people would loving, lovingly refer to as turbo nerds. Um, it's been around a long time. I myself have played Dungeons and Dragons for a very long time, or at least I should say, uh, since I left uh, the the extremely uh, the extreme religious church that I grew up in, uh, and we have a lot to talk about um, with regard to Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, uh, the basics of what has happened is that Dungeons and Dragons uh, has made a move, uh, a financial move. Uh, 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 the owners of Dungeons and Dragons, I should say, have made a financial move uh, that has been very, very unpopular with the uh, fan base. And it's unpopular for a lot of reasons, but it's particularly unpopular because of its unabashed greed. Uh, and I'm gonna explain all of this as we go into the drama mama. However, first, we gotta play the drama mama theme because we have a Drama Mama theme, and it's been a while since I've done a Drama Mama, so we gotta play the Drama Mama theme. So let me play, before we go any further, the Drama Mama, the Drama Mama theme. And um, also, if you're here, you should press subscribe, and you should like the stream, because I assure you, you're gonna have a good time today, and you're gonna learn a lot. Let's hit it with the Drama Mama theme. <laughs> My lovely, lovely imps, it is time now, officially, for Drama Mama. Now, in a Drama Mama investigation, my goal is to always bring as many receipts as possible. And my other goal is to make sure that we present a case uh, that will allow you to uh, further explore on your own. Uh, most of the time, I will give you my personal opinion towards the end of the Drama Mama. Um, and, uh, and, and otherwise provide you the actual evidence so that you can go engage with it on your own, so that you can think about it, you can choose to disagree with me and argue with me in the comments, you can choose to agree with me and compliment me in the comments. Uh, and uh, that's what we're gonna be doing here today. Today we are going to be diving deep into the Dungeons and Dragons, Wizards of the Coast, and the open game license debacle. Now, um, I have a long history with Dungeons and Dragons, okay? The first edition of Dungeons and Dragons that I personally played was D&D 2.0. D&D 2.0, 
I, I barely remember half the rules from 2.0. I only played it one time before moving to uh, 3.5, which is the edition of D&D that I would say uh, most sort of veteran players have stuck with. Now, there are a lot of versions of D&D. It's been out for a long time, the original being Dungeons and Dragons, and then advanced Dungeons and Dragons, then D&D 2.0, D&D 2.5, D&D 3, which really quickly became 3.5 because of some, some issues with 3, uh, and then there was D&D 4E, aka 4th edition, uh, and now there is D&D 5th edition. There's been a lot of drama and a lot of different things over the years. Um, but Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 uh, is an addition that, uh, uh, that is an addition that has a special place in pop culture. And I'm going to explain to you why that's the case. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 uh, was a, a, a revolutionary change to the way that the game was played. A lot of the core mechanics were heavily uh, edited to make it more accessible and also easier to parse even for veteran players. 3.5 also coincided with the creation of a thing called the Open Game License. The Open Game License was uh, uh, a, I mean, it was it was a, a a contract, a, a open contract that allowed people to basically create things for Dungeons and Dragons without like it having to be Dungeons and Dragons. The idea was, well, hey, we've invented this incredibly cool rule set for simulating combat, for simulating and encouraging role playing, uh, and this open games license will allow other people to do their own stuff with it. Um, if you've played D&D, &D, you are very familiar with the term homebrew. If you are not, uh, homebrew refers to basically when somebody writes their own story for a Dungeons and Dragons campaign that doesn't actually follow the sort of official documentation of uh, made by the company um, that created Dungeons and Dragons. Of course, Dungeons and Dragons itself, like the 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 people behind the product, the people who work now for Wizards of the Coast, which that name you're going to get used to. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, they create their own stuff, their own official canon, and uh, you can imagine homebrew uh, as as basically saying, "Well, yeah, I want to use these rules. I want to be able to use the rules for." Uh, a sword attack, for a magic attack, etc. But I want to tell my own story with my own characters. Uh, I would say that uh, most of the uh, games that you end up playing, that, that people end up playing, are to some degree homebrewed. Um, to some degree. Uh, yes, there's all kinds of official play, and at conventions there are officially sanctioned play that follows the exact content and storylines created by the people who work for Wizards of the Coast. Um, but, uh, but most people end up playing homebrew, and you probably know somebody who's done their own Dungeons & Dragons story. In fact, most pop culture media around Dungeons & Dragons is actually uh, homebrew stuff. Uh, it is people using the basic rules to create their own story and their own world. Uh, there have been movies about this, references in, in uh, pop culture. You know, everybody's sitting around a table saying, ah, my character is Thrandar the Barbarian, and Thrandar will, he, you know, he's a hothead, so he's going to charge in first. Roll the dice, chick, 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 etc. Um, that is the like iconic vision of a homebrew set. People making their own characters. People, uh, a, de a, a dungeon master or a game master who sits at the top of the table, looking like that. Actually, here I can show you what they look like. They look like this. Unfortunately, wait. Unfortunately, you have failed. Your rolls. It does, is not successful. Your sword glances off the armor and, and dashes to the side. Your sword gets trapped under the dragon's foot and you are crushed into a pulp. Your character is dead. So that's kind of like, that's like the dungeon master, you know? He, he tells you what the story is and he makes up a story. And hell, even the comedic stuff is often, um, you know, around Dungeons and Dragons is themed around, uh, you know, is themed around <laughs> dungeon masters writing their own absurd stories and people make fun of it and some of them are really good and some of them are really bad. 
Um, do you play Dungeons and Dragons? Are you usually a player or a dungeon master? Well, I was about to talk about that, so that's great that you asked. Uh, I have played Dungeons and Dragons for a long time. I have both played as a dungeon master and as a gamer, as like a player at the table. I have played at many tables and, um, and I started really getting into Dungeons and Dragons with that aforementioned version 3.5. Uh, in fact, uh, I most got into Dungeons and Dragons on a offshoot of Dungeons and Dragons called Pathfinder. This is going to become very important as we get on in this drama. So like I said, buckle in, because it's a bit of a long story. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, in 3.5, during during the era of D Dungeons and Dragons 3.5, uh, there was a this like I said this thing called the Open Games License was created. We're going to actually read through and look over the Open Game License uh, in a little bit here, but for now, just understand that it basically said that you can use the basic rules and even some of the basic stuff from Dungeons and Dragons without being in trouble legally. You will not be considered uh, to be, uh, you know you know, infringing on somebody's copyright. You can have an elf, you can have a, a an elf monk, you can have an orc warrior, you can have a, uh, you know, a thief, you can have all a wizard, you can have a goblin wizard, all these things are fine. And you can even use the rules of rolling these certain specific types of dice, and it doesn't have to be D&D themed, uh, you can still use that. A uh, enterprising young company named Paizo, which is now one of the biggest gaming companies in the world, decided to create their own branch of the rules of Dungeons & Dragons 3.5, which they called Pathfinder. Now, there are a lot of differences between D&D 3.5 and Pathfinder. Uh, however, uh, Pathfinder was nonetheless, uh, is it's, it's actually funny, Pathfinder is sometimes referred to colloquially as playing D&D. &D. Even though you're playing a game that's called Pathfinder and it's only like connected to D&D &D from that, that open game license that was created during edition 3.5 of Dungeons and Dragons, people still call it playing D&D &D, even when you're playing Pathfinder. Pathfinder is what I have played the most of, and it is incredibly popular. Like I said, Paizo is now, the company that created Pathfinder, uh, is now one of the biggest gaming companies in the entire world. Yes, yeah, sometimes people, yes, exactly. As Bluestone in chat says, sometimes people even call it as D&D 3.75 because of, uh, because there's, there's so many uh, core similarities, even if there's a lot of differences. Now, uh, Pathfinder, uh, just so you guys understand where I come from with Pathfinder, I have played so much Pathfinder over the years, both as a dungeon master and as a uh, player. I have literally gone to a convention and played a 1,000 person coordinated game of Pathfinder. And it was a wild experience. I. I, I have, <laughs> there was some issues with it, but it was nonetheless a fascinating and very, very interesting experience. And like, this was official play. You had to go on a website and type in your, your player ID and, and it's all documented, it's all official play. I played a lot of official and unofficial Pathfinder. Um, and there was a lot of things I really liked about Pathfinder. Um, in fact, before I started playing uh, uh, like official Pathfinder, like through the actual, like the company run system where they set up these big events and you go and you play and you earn special things, blah, 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 blah. Um, before I did that, Pathfinder was a outlet of a certain sort. It was a way for me to have a social experience where uh, weirdness was more tolerated. And uh, this is something you're going to actually hear a lot. And in fact, uh, if you go down in the comments after watching this video, I, I assure you that there will be many people telling their story uh, with Dungeons and Dragons or with Pathfinder or with any of these similar role-playing games in the comments after this video, you know, after you're done watching this video. Um, a lot of queer people especially found uh, uh, a social home uh, 
uh, attached to Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons and all kinds of stuff. And not just not just queer people, not just gay people and trans people, um, though certainly a lot of them, but a lot of people, a lot of people who, for whatever reason, did not find uh, 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 you know themselves to be accepted in many other social uh, environments. Uh, for me, uh, almost immediately upon discovering Pathfinder, uh, which coincided very closely with my discovery that I was trans, uh, long story on that one, uh, I've done videos on it, but the long and short of it is that I grew up in an extremely Christian cult, and I did not have the language to explain the gender dysphoria I had been experiencing my life until I left home. Uh, and interestingly, when I left home is also when I started playing D&D. D&D afforded me an environment where I could play as whatever character I wanted. And in that environment, you are encouraged to accept people as they present. So, uh, your character is a, a dragon rogue. The other characters are supposed to treat your character and you, therefore, by extension, as the dragon rogue. If your character is a female wizard, your, the other characters at the table are encouraged to suspend their disbelief or whatever and, and accept you as that character. Many tables will enforce using character names to help, uh, uh, to help bring forward the, uh, the fun of play. The fun of play being getting lost in a role-playing experience. Dungeons and & Dragons and Pathfinder uh, are examples of a very complicated and amazing role-playing experience where people essentially participate in free-form theater. There are performances, there are jokes, there are failed jokes, there are failed performances. It is a very dynamic and amazing uh, experience to sit at a table with your friends and pretend to be dragons and uh, goblins and whatever else you want to be and it can serve for many people as a form of catharsis especially if you don't feel that you can be yourself anyway in your real life I think you can understand where I might be coming from with this at the current moment in my life when I first started playing Dungeons and Dragons there was no chance of anyone accepting me as a woman which is what I am I'm a trans woman uh, I transitioned some time ago but at that time, no one in my life would accept that. In fact, it was uh, it was severely punished. The idea was punished to the degree that I was literally disowned and kicked out of my house at one point. Uh, so D and D offered not only a fun social experience, but a fun social experience where I could uh, leave myself. Uh, and become a character, and I could become a character that I infused love with, and it would be accepted, and it would be fun, and nobody treated you weird about it. Um, so, uh, so what I'm trying to say with all of this is that uh, I have a long and deep attachment with role-playing tabletop games like Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons, especially Pathfinder for me, uh, and so does a lot of other people. Uh, again, the trans experience is not the only one. There are lots of people for whom it is appealing to uh, to engage in a level of light esca uh, escapism with friends, to engage in a fun and mutually supportive adventure uh, with fantasy trappings or sci-fi trappings in some cases uh, with friends. Um, oh my goodness, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, just go ahead and put that right there. Thank you very much. I just got some food. Fantastic. Very soon. As K Prime says, tabletop RPGs are like collaborative storytelling with a rule set. So, that's my experience with 3.5, which is, uh, uh, it, which is, and now, like I said, specifically Pathfinder was the one that I became most attached to. Pathfinder would not have been possible without the open games license. Remember I mentioned that we were going to talk about that a whole bunch this in this upcoming segment? That's what that's what I'm that's what I'm talking about. Uh, oh yes, I should also state uh, Killjoy 40k uh, brings up a really good point. Paizo was once Paizo got big, um, they they had 
uh, well, I'll, I'll read out. I'll read out this message first. Paizo is huge. They had a non-binary character in like 2011, and I think they had a bunch of items that let you change your gender in in, in the game in a very, very, very inclusive way. Far over Wizards of the Coast. Uh, they even fi fixed really problematic items that Gygax made that cursed you to be the opposite gender. Yes, uh, Paizo uh, as a company has been very, very, very. Um, has been very, very, very uh, open and uh, progressive uh, in their portrayal. Uh, there are a number of members of their actual team um, who are uh, non-binary, who are uh, trans. They're, they're, they have a very diverse staff, and as a result, there was a lot of attachment to the stuff that Paizo created because Paizo made it normal to be gay, to be queer. They even made it possible. They gave you the tools to create stories where you could tell that story if you so wanted. Um, anyway, uh, uh, now Paizo is not some kind of perfect company. There's a lot of issues at Paizo, don't get me wrong. I've even talked about them on this channel. But I'm what I'm trying to point at is the fact that um, this company really recognized and embraced the idea that there were a lot of people who found value in this game beyond it just being a good game. There was a social aspect that was valuable to all of these people. And Paizo was only capable of doing what they did because, or at least largely, because of this thing called the OGL, the Open Game License. Now, a little bit more history before we uh, 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 before we we jump in fully into what's going on right now, one more piece of history: Dungeons and Dragons Fourth Edition, published by Wizards of the Coast, attempted to move away from the open games license, and instead they moved to a alternative uh, license, which I, I'm now blanking on the name of. It doesn't exactly matter. They moved to a proprietary license, which is actually why uh, there is very little third-party material for Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition. Uh, it was actually considered to be a massive blunder on Wizards of the Coast's part, moving Dungeons & Dragons away from the open game license, which had produced a plethora of third-party, incredibly creative things. And when I say third-party stuff for Dungeons & Dragons, I mean figurines, uh, dice, uh, unique pre-printed rule, uh, rule sheets, character sheets, uh, adventures, entire adventures that were written by third-party writers to be played and used with the D&D OGL rule set. Um, just so much stuff that was made that was designed to supplement and make the game more than just a rule set. Uh, and fourth edition stepped away from this and you actually can see that even now if you go and look up fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons you will find that most of the stuff uh, is published as official products by Wizards of the Coast and also that there is way less of it if you look at how much stuff followed uh, Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 versus things that covered uh, that, that followed or were based off of 4.4 uh, e as they call it uh, you will discover there's basically none by comparison and uh, and it was considered a massive failure and in fact uh, during fourth edition uh, uh uh, yes, the game systems license. Thank you, Giltroy 40k. That's what it's called. 4E uses a thing called the games systems license, which people consider to be very draconian. It was incredibly interested in maintaining all intellectual property for Wizards of the Coast, the owners of Dungeons and Dragons. And during that time, uh, the company that I mentioned before, Paizo, began to rise. Now, I mentioned that when Paizo started, they were just a very small company, and now they're one of the biggest gaming companies in the world. And that was because, largely, uh, people abandoned 4.0 uh, 4 or 4E. They were like, we're not going to do, we're not going to invest in a system that is so locked down. And so people started checking out alternatives. People discovered Pathfinder, and people discovered that Pathfinder made by Paizo was really, really good. Like, really, really good. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, 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 and so this became a sort of renaissance 
for tabletop gaming, where people were jumping into this new uh, competitor to D&D, or, or I guess alternative to D&D. Then came 5th edition. 5th uh, edition of D&D went back to the open games license, which was actually very good. And you will now see that D&D 5th edition is not only very popular, but is also the edition that is used in tons of now world famous, um, now world famous D&D uh, uh, &D content. Uh, things like Critical Role, Dimension 20. These are D&D &D themed podcasts and TV shows that have had like uh, almost unbelievable popularity. They are so popular, they have earned television deals because they're so popular. And these are based off of the uh, open game license version of fifth edition. Um, a lot of people, yeah, as, as as Gay Aaron in chat says, I believe I started playing with 5th edition. A lot of people got in on 5th edition. Um, and 5th uh, edition uh, being an open game license meant that a lot of people were willing to start making content, like third party content for Dungeons and Dragons once again. Um, so many people are using 5th edition. And that brings us to now. Just the other day, a uh, a leaked uh, a leaked update to the open games license uh, uh, appeared on the internet, and it was confirmed very quickly as a genuine uh, a genuine draft. Uh, although the initial communication, as you will soon see, uh, did not seem. Uh, to communicate that this was a draft at all. In fact, it seemed very much like this is what they were intended to publish soon. Uh, Wizards of the Coast has now officially confirmed that the, there is a existing version of the OGL called OGL 1.1. And this is where the drama comes in. Because it's not good. Okay, so if you, uh, if you thought it was a, uh, a draconian tactic for uh, for Dungeons and Dragons in their fourth edition to change to a terrible proprietary license to try and like carve the market out, which failed by the way, like I said, it failed. They didn't go out of business, but they lost a lot of players during fourth edition. You're in for a real, real treat. So first off, before we go any further, let's talk about the uh, original OGL, okay? Let's open it up and let's take a look at it, okay? There is a, a, a beautiful archived version of this right here, and we're gonna take a quick look at it, okay? After I get some water in me, so. Ah, almost knocked my water over. No good? All right, the open game license. Oh, let me get the text up on here. There we go. All right. There we go. Now we got the text. This is the original OGL, okay? What is the open game license? The open game license is a royalty-free copywriting license developed by Wizards of the Coast. Yes, that's right. The original OGL was created by people at Wizards of the Coast. And not to distract away from us looking at it immediately, but something that you will realize is that Wizards of the Coast is not the same Wizards of the Coast uh, that it was in uh, 2004 when this was originally published. The uh, uh, the OGL was was published by a team of people who many of whom are no longer at Wizards of the Coast. In fact, they created the OGL with that in mind. They knew that corporations keep the same name but change the people inside at all times, that corporations and products change over time, and their goal was to create something that would allow people to indulge in this beautiful game uh, for as long as possible without having to pay just for enjoying the, the concept of a role-playing game with some basic rules. There are different wizards. These are different wizards that are on the coast now. It's the same company, 
but all the people inside have moved around. Some people have left the company. Some have moved into different positions. Some have left the industry entirely. That's just how it goes. Anyway, just wanted to make note of that. Where can I read the text of the OGL? You can download the full text version of the OGL, a 12K RTF, right here. What are the penalties for violating the terms of the license? You are potentially liable to three groups of people. You know, there's a there's a copyright notice that could be sent by if if you are like tampering with the OGL itself. Uh, you could be sued by by Wizards of the Coast for violating a trademark, etc. Now keep in mind that violating this trademark. Uh, the way, or sorry, violating this license would be rather difficult. Uh, it would require you to basically copy like word for word aspects of the document itself or of Wizard of Wizards of the Coast's actual stuff that they made. Um, like for example, uh, to give an example of this, if you were to take say. Uh, the Curse of Strahd, which is a famous D and D uh, 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 module, it's a famous advent uh, like adventure path uh, for Dungeons and Dragons. If you were to take that and you were to go, actually, this is the Curse of Steve, and and everything else is exactly the same, but you change the names, you could still be sued for that. Not not because this doesn't cop this doesn't cover uh, like individual works. It doesn't cover somebody who wrote a story. That's their story. They just licensed it in a way that, hey, we're using the bare bones rules of this system, if that makes sense. Why does Wizards of the Coast call, hold the copyright to the license? Wizards of the Coast wrote the license and wants to control the right to make changes to the license in the future. Now this right here, what you see highlighted right here, Wizards of the Coast wrote the license and wants to control the right to make changes to the license in the future. That right there is about to get us into a lot of trouble. And now, it's in its initial form, it's not particularly sinister. Uh, obviously, you want to be able to retain the right to make a change to a license if, uh, <laughs> Like say, what if you accidentally uh, copy you like you fat fingered control V and you you posted a link to like I don't know your password like you copy you copy pasted your password into the text of the document you want to be able to retain the right to go change that so that this you know what I mean so like in and of itself wanting to retain the rights to make changes to the license is in and of itself not a bad thing. However, as you will soon find out, it does open the door to some other things. Does Wizards of the Coast copyright to the license mean that anything I publish using the license is owned by Wizards of the Coast? This is also important. No, the copyright on the license pertains to the terms of the license itself, not to materials distributed. So again, that's saying if you write a story that includes rolling D20s to do damage, uh, you still own that story they just own the right to the to the license that gave you the rules to do that, if that makes sense. Can't Wizards of the Coast change the license in a way that I wouldn't like? Yes, it could. However, the license already defines what will happen to content that has previously been distributed using an earlier version in Section 9. As a result, even if Wizards made a change you disagreed with, this is important as well. You could continue to use an earlier acceptable version at your option. In other words, there's no reason for Wizards to ever make a change that the community of people using the open game license would object to because the community would just ignore the change anyway. Okay, that is probably the most important part of, of this entire license. Now we could go and read through the full text of the license. We're not gonna do that here. We're just gonna look at this, at these commonly asked questions and we're just gonna fixate specifically on this. The, uh, the, the goal of this open games license was to ensure that in perpetuity, people could always continue to legally play the games that they made, the games that they enjoy in the format that they like. That, that Wizards of the Coast cannot sort of retroactively, uh, uh, retroactively um, take ownership of or, uh, or, or steal anything that you created using the open game license uh, uh, because the open game license 
can just be adopted and used anyway. The open game license exists whether you want to, you know, maintain, uh, uh, you know, whether you want to maintain uh, agreement with the corporation or not, you have a right to use those things because you can keep using the license that you were given. And this is where it starts to get very complicated because you see, Wizards of the Coast is basically trying to do a takesies backsies on that particular aspect of the license, okay? That's the drama that we had to build all this history up to in order for you to be able to understand. You see, Wizards of the Coast has now, uh, you know, like I said, officially confirmed that they are creating an open games license 1.1. And that part of the license has mysteriously disappeared. Uh, in fact, what they are attempting to do is the opposite of what this states. Notice this final line here. In other words, there's no reason for wizards to ever make a change that the community of people using the open game license would object to because the community would just ignore the change anyway. Do you, do you understand the mechanics of that? The, the person, the people writing this original open game license were basically saying, well, Wizards of the Coast would never be so stupid as to try to violate this license because everyone would just keep using the license and completely ignore Wizards of the Coast. But Wizards of the Coast is not the same Wizards of the Coast that existed when this license was created. And as it turns out, this Wizards of the Coast seems to think that there actually is some reason to uh, disagree with the community of people and attempt to force those people into behaving differently. Now, this is where we are going to jump into one of the first articles published about this change, okay? Let me just bring this up real quick, okay? This is the breakdown of the new 1.1 leaked uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, 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 open game license 1.1. We're gonna go through, this was an article written by uh, Linda Kodega, uh, who is a writer for uh, gizmodo.com. We are going to read through this uh, and we're gonna talk about some of the aspects of it. One thing that you're gonna notice as we go through this new license for Dungeons and Dragons is that it basically undoes or at least attempts to, and that's also key, attempts to undo almost the entire spirit of the original open games, open game license. And uh, another thing that it tries to do is it's trying to push people to adopt D&D &D Beyond. Now, if you're not familiar with Dungeons and Dragons like intimately, you might not know what Dungeons and Dragons Beyond is. Those of you who do play Dungeons and Dragons are probably cringing a little bit right now. You're, you've got a pain in your gut that's making you go, oof. See, D&D Beyond is a monthly subscription service that costs anywhere between nine and $20 uh, per month, sometimes even more, um, that sells officially licensed uh, uh, and partner products. Of, of Dungeons and Dragons, including Critical Role, uh, including uh, a bunch of other, uh, uh, I don't know uh, the, the, other the other companies that have published with this, but there's like four or five booklets that are themed around Critical Role. Critical Role is a show that is built off of Dungeons and Dragons that is its own entire creative story. It's a whole team of really talented people and, uh, and, and, D&D Beyond is an online subscription service that includes a bunch of stuff from that show. It includes a bunch of booklets that have been published by Wizards of the Coast. It includes a bunch of officially licensed products and it requires a subscription. Now there's a lot of independent issues with D&D Beyond. For example, people have been very frustrated about the licensing in, D in Dungeons and Dragons Beyond because for example, when you're playing with a group of people, there's a whole bunch of licensing hoops that, uh, that you have to jump through. Uh, your dungeon master, your assigned dungeon master needs to own the books that you are going to be using. Now, a, a tradition in Dungeons and Dragons is to borrow books from your friends. These are expensive books. The books for Dungeons and Dragons can go as high as $100. 
uh, they're enormous tomes. And often when you're playing with your friends, you borrow a book that one of your friends has, but you can't do that when you're playing online and there's a digital license for everything that you have to purchase. So this is independent of this issue for now. However, people have their issues with Dungeons and Dragons Beyond because it locks people into DRM. It locks people into being unable to freely share their books. And of course, there is some workarounds. There are some uh, things that have been changed over time. Like you can you can do, you can do these weird, uh, uh, you can, unofficially borrow people's accounts. You can have somebody at your table buy it or whatever. But the demon, but but the, uh, but the, I almost said my own name, but the dungeon master does have to be the book holder if you want to run a online game in this matter. Now, D&D Beyond is not the only online tabletop RPG tool. There are many others like Roll20, which basically allow you to do the same thing. However, obviously, because they are not a licensed product, they are not allowed to incorporate all of the same materials. So even if you have a physical copy of a D&D &D book, you can't just directly, like that, that stuff can't be uploaded into Roll20 for people to use. If you want to be able to use the things that have been created, you have to pay the subscription to D&D &D Beyond. And Something that we're about to talk to notice is that the new open games license 1.1 is fixated on driving people into the D&D Beyond subscription service. So let's dive in. This is an article by Linda Codega called Cancel D&D Beyond Subscriptions Forced Hasbro's Hand. Swift consumer action prompted Dungeons & Dragons publishers and Wizards of the Coast to scrap licensing updates. The players aren't done yet. Hey, wait a second. This isn't the one. Hey, they changed it. This isn't the right article. Give me a second. Hold on a second here. Here we go. This is the one I'm looking for. Here we go. I think this is the one. Yes, yes, yes. This is the one. Sorry about that. It's one of those things where... Whatever. We'll continue. Wizards of the Coast breaks its silence on Dungeons & Dragons open game license. After facing a week of constant backlash online, the Hasbro subsidiary finally breaks its silence. Wizards of the Coast, the Hasbro subsidiary that publishes Dungeons & Dragons, revealed details of its new open game license on Friday and attempted to answer questions about the future of D&D community that was raised after io9 broke the news about contents of a draft of the document. This is the original, uh, this is the original one. This was, uh, I think this is, yeah, this was the actual original one that was, what was discussed here. God, this is one of the things, by the way, small rant, small side rant. I had all of these links pinned out and Gizmodo changes their links because of the whole way that news sites operate now where they want to give you the newest piece. But like, I already know what the newest piece is. Don't bring me the newest piece. I wanted to go to the original one. Anyway, small rant. Makes my job very hard. Anyway. Despite reassurances from Wizards of the Coast last month, month, the original OGL will become an unauthorized agreement and it appears no new content will be permitted to be created under the original license. Now, this right here, no new content will be permitted to be created under the original license. That is what we called good old fashioned bullshit. Uh, you see, the OGL continues to exist uh, regardless, and the word and its legal prescriptions still exist, even if Wizards of the Coast retains the ability to change parts of it. The problem, though, is that because they can change parts of it, they can essentially copyright troll the shit out of people because because they retain the ability to change the license at any point, they can remove the part that says that they're not gonna change it in a way that will affect old content. Now, of course, this isn't gonna hold up in court uh, at all, more or less, from what I can understand. I'm not a lawyer, but from what I can tell, these like, uh, the, the, the sort of like, back backwards compatible claims that they are trying to, um, that they are trying to say uh, is not going to uh, hold up at all. However, what does hold up is that they can refuse to acknowledge the validity of any of the prior 
uh, products. And what that means is that anybody who built their products off of the OGL will basically have to deal with the fact that uh, Hasbro has claimed that that is an illegi illegitimate product. And it also means that they probably can't advertise themselves as uh, uh, being a part of the OGL anymore, even though the OGL was a huge part of the foundation of a lot of literal companies that have built uh, wonderful product lines based off of the OGL. Ah, uh, yes, uh, uh, there's a video by Legal Eagle that I think is really, really good. We might even watch some of that uh, as this goes on, but for now, I'm gonna stick to this. The uh, the this this weird attempt at like threatening people retroactively by removing aspects of the of the OGL that previously exists is nothing but scummy behavior. Okay, there's no ifs ands or buts about it. This is a power grab. It is an attempt to force the hands of, in honesty, the mo the smallest. Uh, content creators. Uh, it is meant to discourage people from uh, from continuing to use the OGL as it was intended. It is designed to delegitimize people who made things under the previously fully by the books OGL. And I want to tell you though that it's basically bullshit. That part, as far as I can tell, is bullshit. And um, this is actually a part that's explained in the Legal Eagle video that somebody just shared. But the reason for this is that under American copyright law, once again, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but under American copyright law, you can't actually copyright rules. You can't actually, there's, there was, so the open game license itself wasn't actually particularly legally valid in the first place. People created it because they, for it was for, it was done for pardon me a spiritual reason. It was done, be, basically to to show a hand of good faith. We are not going to sue you. It was a company saying we are giving you the right to do this, so you don't have to worry about it all. Now that is revoked, and even if it is indeed true, which it is true, that you can't actually copyright rules to a game. Um, like, like th that's not a possible thing you can do. Um, not even games like Monopoly or Uno can copyright their rules. They can, they can trademark the name. They can copyright the colors and the look of it. They can copyright the way the dragons look. They can copyright specific monsters, but they can't actually copyright the rules. Um, and uh, so, but what it does do is it creates a, uh, it changes the spirit of the situation. Now, small people don't have that assurance that they're not going to get in trouble. They have to basically say, yeah, I'm willing to risk pissing off Hasbro. I'm willing to risk pissing off a multi-million dollar corporation. And as it turns out, people don't really want to do that. So what, this, what the effect of this is, is that, or what the effect of the original OGL was, was to basically spread their arms and invite people, please make your own things. We want to see this game universe thrive. And what the new one is, is now you are ours. You better pay attention to us. You better play by our rules, okay? That's part of the reason why there's been such a backlash. Even if it is still legal for you to technically create Dungeons and Dragons themed rule-based content. The fact that Hasbro has announced their hostility to it, the fact that Wizards of the Coast has announced their hostility to it has a freezing effect. And it also complicates people who are actually in a position of making money off of their thing for reasons that we'll see in just a minute. Let's continue. This is talking about the, uh, the OGL. Uh, which we're not gonna go through this, we're gonna go to this bit right here. What is it new, what is in the new OGL 1.1? A lot, actually. While the original open gaming license is a relatively short document coming in at under 900 words, important, the new draft of the OGL 1.1, which was provided to io9 by a non-Wizards of the Coast developer, is over 9,000 words long. Do you see what I'm talking about? About this being a spiritual uh, discourager? That this is designed to be a, this is a mental and uh, intimidation war that is being played. A and the question is why? Why? The open games license has led to Dungeons and Dragons becoming a worldwide phenomenon. And the answer, of course, to that question is money, as we will discover as time goes on. So yeah. Uh, 10 times as long as the original one, 
which in and of itself is very discouraging. How regularly do you read a 9,000 word document of rules? Uh, never, right? Uh, see, this is a weird thing. This is something that like uh, uh, end user licensing agreements do. You, you know, there's there's a history of end user license agreements not holding up well in court. And part of the reason for that is because you want to boot up your new video game that you just got and you get hit with a document that's 20,000 pages long. You can't be expected to read a 20,000 page document so that you can boot up your new Mario game. This is, by the way, interestingly, why, uh, like I said, why end user licensing agreements don't have a whole lot of uh, incredible strength in court. Um, Yes, and there are literally laws about using documents like that that are basically unreadable to the layman. However, it's not illegal to make an unreadable document. It just means it won't hold up in court. But there's another problem, which is who can afford to take people to court? Do you think that you and your podcast buddies making a podcast for your friends in town and for a couple people on the internet have the money to go to court with Hasbro? No, but Hasbro has a team of lawyers on, on retainer at all times that they can take anybody to court. Hence, intimidation. Let's continue. It, it, uh, the new Open Games License 1.1 addresses new technologies like blockchains and NFTs and takes a strong stance against bigoted content, explicitly stating the company may terminate the agreement if third-party creators publish material that is blatantly racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, bigoted, or otherwise discriminatory. Now you'll notice, once again, this is, uh, this sounds kind of nice on the surface. You're like, wow, good. They're taking a stance against discrimination. But then you realize that it doesn't actually mean all that much. This is basically put in here to make people feel like, like, look, I don't want, I have my theories as to why this was put in there. And I don't want to color the, the, the build up portion of this so long. So I'm not going to. Just recognize that's not actually saying that much. They're basically just saying we don't we're not gonna formally license your content anymore, which they could already do anyway. They've already been able to do that. They were able to do that with the OGL. It's 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 silly. Let's continue. One of the biggest changes to the document is that it updates the previously available OGL to state it is no longer an authorized license agreement. There's that thing that I was mentioning before. It says they're literally taking that one line that says that they can make any changes that they want in the future to say we've changed this to be completely invalid in perpetuity in retrospect, which is bonkers. It's bonkers. By ending the original OGL, many licensed publishers will have to completely overhaul their products and distribution in order to comply with the updated rules. Large publishers who focus almost exclusively on products based on the original OGL, including Paizo, Kobold Press, and Green Ronin, these are three enormous gaming companies, will be under pressure to update their business model incredibly fast. Now, there's a couple aspects of this. Um, and one of them is not actually about going to court. You see, uh, this type of change, like I mentioned, n might not hold up on court. But you want to know what would hold up in court? If uh, if Paizo, Kobold Press, and and Green Ronin all had little stickers on their uh, or or little printouts on all of their stuff and pages in all of their documents that say this is an open game licensed video game, but now the open games light or uh, tabletop game, but this the open game license is no longer valid. That puts them on the fire because they are advertising something that isn't true. Many many gaming books. If you go on your shelf and you open a Paizo book, will have a big segment in the beginning that talks about the open game license and says that they're licensed under that. But now because of Hasbro, that's they can't say that anymore. So while they might not be able to be taken to court over violating a copyright in, with regards to Hasbro, they have to reprint their books, otherwise they're printing something in them that's not true. That is a terrible, terrible uh, attack at competitors. It is literally can only be understood. That can only be understood as a attack at any competitor to Dungeons and Dragons. It is a it is a goal to damage their business by rendering a contract that was used in good faith as no longer valid. Ridiculous. Let's continue. 
This is no mistake. According to the document procured by io9, the new agreement states that the open game license was always intended to allow the community to help grow D&D and expand it creatively. It wasn't intended to subsidize major competitors, especially now that the PDF is by far the most common form of distribution. This is from the text of the new OGL 1.1. They're literally just saying, they're claiming that because the OGL, which was created in 2004, uh, was used as the baseline for, uh, <laughs> was used as the baseline to create a totally different game that uses some of the same basic rules, but otherwise is totally independent. If you go and put a D&D &D book and a Pathfinder book side by side, you wouldn't even know they were the same thing. You would have to actually use the dice to recognize where the like genetic material comes from. But they're trying to say that they're subsidizing their competitors. Ridiculous, an absolutely absurd claim. This sentiment is reiterated later in the document. The OGL wasn't intended to fund major competitors and it wasn't intended to allow people to make D&D &D apps, videos, or anything other than printed or printable materials for use while gaming. We are updating the OGL in part to make that clear. What this line says here is basically that they only really want the OGL to be used for extreme basics. So basically, you can print out uh, uh, you can print out character sheets that are your own type. That's what they. That's that is that is Wizards of the Coast telling you that they think the purpose of the OGL is to basically let you print out your own character sheets, which is a gigantic slap in the face. The fact that the OGL has been used to create like more than you can possibly imagine. Not even I could even, not even I having done all this research have be even begun to touch the depths of stuff that has been created using the OGL. The OGL has been inspiring countless games, countless uh, 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 spin-offs. It, it's, it was designed to promote the idea of tabletop RPG playing as a whole using a rule set that is universally agreed upon to be very good. Let's continue. Paizo Incorporated, remember them? Publisher of the Pathfinder RPG, one of D&D's largest competitors, declined to comment on the changes for this article, stating that the rules update was a complicated and ongoing situation. That's changed, we're gonna get to that. That's the fun part for later. Chris Promus, founder and president of Green Ronin Publishing, said that despite the fact that one of their own products, Mutants and Masterminds, was published under the original OGL in 2002 and is still available today, they had not seen the updated OGL and they do not believe there is any benefit to switching to the new one as described. That's because there isn't any benefit. Wizards of the Coast declined to comment for this article or answer any specific questions about the leaked OGL document. A spokesperson directed io9 to a blog post the company published in December, which reassures the community that this OGL will not materially affect the majority of people working in the industry. Do you believe that to be true? Does, I mean, the D&D community at large does not believe that to be true. Uh, they, don't, they don't believe that a change which, it, which makes the last version uh, totally wrong and oh, uh, which, which, sorry, totally negates the last version of the, of the document and leaves the door open for even more aggressive changes in the future. They don't believe that that's not going to affect the majority of people working in the industry especially when they specifically say we are we do not want to subsidize our competition. This is where it gets really weird, okay? What will happen to the original Open Games license? The original OGL granted perpetual worldwide non-exclusive license to the open game content commonly called the systems resource document. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. The systems resource document is a portion of the original of the original OGL. The systems resource document is basically the thing that explains the mathematics behind the mechanics of D&D. It explains what it means to roll a 1d20, it explains how damage works, it explains stuff like that. It explains how to do calculations for uh, defenses, stuff like that. The mechanics of the game. That's what the SRD is. Anyway, 
Uh, the original OGL granted a perpetual worldwide non-exclusive license to the system's resource document and directed that licenses may use any authorized version of this license to copy, modify, and distribute any open game content originally distributed under any version of this license. However, the updated OGL says that this agreement is an update to the previous available version, which is no longer authorized. So, so what this is, <laughs> so again, by the text of the new document, it is very clear that Wizards of the Coast wishes to essentially denounce uh, and retract all previous licenses, even though those licenses were, were given in perpetual worldwide non-exclusive format. But it gets worse. The new document clarifies further in the warranty section that this agreement governs your use of the licensed content and unless otherwise stated in this agreement, any prior agreements between us and you are no longer in force. According to the attorneys consulted for this article, the new language may indicate that Wizards of the Coast is rendering any future use of the original OGL void and asserting that if anyone wants to continue using the open game content of any kind, they will then need to abide by the terms of the updated OGL, which is far more restrictive in agreement than the original OGL. Wizards of the Coast has declined to clarify if this is the case. Yes, uh, as Killjoy in chat says, I've altered the agreement. Pray I don't alter it any further. Unironically, that is literally what it is. It's saying, you act we told you this was in, perpetu in perpetuity, but also we had a little loophole in there that said that we can, we can actually retract that. We can do a little takesies backsies. Let's continue. Who will be affected by the new OGL 1.1? If the original li license is indeed uh, no longer viable. Every single licensed publisher will be affected by the new agreement because every commercial creator will be asked to report their products new and old to Wizards of the Coast. Literally an imperial takeover. Additionally, while the original OGL did not specif specifically outline what kind of content third-party creators would make available and profit from, the updated OD OGL is very specific. The updated license only allows for creation of role-playing games and supplements in printed media and static electronic file formats. It does not allow for anything else. This means it is not uh, including but not limited to things like videos, so there's YouTubers, virtual tabletops, there's Roll20, and uh, there's Roll20 and uh, uh, tabletop simulator, or virtual tabletop campaigns. Once again, there's there's Roll20 and uh, and tabletop simulator, computer games, novels, apps, graphic novels, music, songs, dances, and even pantomimes. You may engage in these activities only to the extent allowed under the Wizards of the Coast fan content policy or separately agreed between you and us. The fan content policy can be read here, but in broad strokes, it allows for free content based on or incorporating our IP. Fan content includes fan art, videos, podcasts, blogs, websites, streaming content, tattoos, altars to your cleric's de deity, etc. Wow, that's so dirty. Oh yeah, by the way, this is one thing you're gonna encounter as we go through this, is that Wizards of the Coast are like the worst you thought that 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 there were some like horrible rule Nazi grognard neckbeard DMs out there. Wizards of the Coast has proven themselves to be the ultimate form of this. Throughout the entire throughout the entire document, they make stupid themed jokes. At, like they're like, oh my god, there's another example of this that we're gonna encounter later on, where they're just like a teehee while they're literally telling you that they're trying to actively fuck everyone except for themselves. It's so annoying. It's, oh my god, it's so gross. It comes off as so disgusting. It's like, it's like, eh, cleric, altars to your cleric's deity. <laughs> well, that's protected under our new games license, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, grognard, uh, it's an old D&D term. A grognard is basically, a grognard is basically somebody who is like a, they're usually referred to as like rules purists or extreme hardcore players. A grognard is somebody who, um, who is totally incapable of like, uh, of like, uh, uh, bending at all. They're usually like extremely cruel to new players. It's a, it's a slang, it's a slang term that's used to describe like shitty, shitty players, mostly old school players who are really, really married to the original types of D&D. 
Yeah, this is a Games Workshop level of IP protection. Yes, uh, Grognard is a D&D chud. Yeah, it's somebody, it's like a, usually a sexist, neck-bearded piece of shit who's obsessed with following all of the rules to a T, who will mock you for not knowing little things, who's super hostile to new players, etc. It's a slang term. It's like a, uh, you could call it a slur, I guess. Not really, though, but let's continue. Uh, yes. The leaked OGL 1.1 indicates that Wizards of the Coast may not give licensees a lot of time to adjust and agree. The document reads, if you want to publish systems resource document based content on or after January 13, 2023 and commercialize it, which let's be real, is basically everyone. If you are writing modules for D&D, we live in fucking capitalism. You have to sell shit to make a living. If you're spending your time writing stuff that's meant to be played with a, a universally enjoyed rule system, you're going to be commercializing it to some degree, but we'll get there as we go on. Uh, you have until January 13. Wait, that's immediate. We, yesterday was January 13. Now, to be fair, they haven't put this into action yet, but this line right here indicates that they were indicating to actually put into, act, uh, into action. We are going to shortly jump into some of the responses that have finally come from Wizards of the Coast. And one of the things that they claim, which we're gonna see in just a minute here, is that this was just a draft. They weren't intending to launch this anytime soon. And yet, in the original draft, they they put a hard date of January 13th. Anyway, io 9 source indicated that the final version of the document was in originally intended to be released on January 4th, which would have given companies and creators seven business days to agree and comply. Do you see how ridiculously aggressive and dirty this is? Do you see why the, the community had such a negative response? Well, we gotta keep going. Let's continue. What's changing in the new OGL? The updated OGL is divided into non-commercial and commercial agreements, and the rules are slightly different if you're making money from direct sales or access to your work. The biggest change between the two sections is a, sections is a tiered earning system which they're gonna explain in a minute, new royalties and rules for the use of crowdfunding. There is some clarity given about Patreon and tips. Basically, if your content is, avail is available for free, but people can choose to support you voluntarily without having access affected, you are considered non-commercial. Well, how kind of them. Basically, in the new OGL, uh, as long as you publish everything you do for free, you're allowed to have a Patreon. How kind of them. I'm glad that, that, I'm glad that the uh, self-styled gods at Wizards of the Coast said that you can have a Patreon. It's amazing because the things that they've done here are like reaching above and beyond, uh, <laughs> above and beyond even close to their legal ability. They can't tell you anyway that you can't do a Patreon. How magnanimous, indeed, indeed. Additionally, all creators will need to clearly and deliberately distinguish their content from licensed content. The new document reads that this must be done in a way that allows a reader of your licensed work to understand the distinction without checking any other document. The updated OGL suggests a different color font or asterisk on the page or putting a separate index or li list in the back of your licensed work that lists out what exactly you use from the SRD. Pathetic. They're basically saying that if you are if you are writing a a module and you tell people to do a a uh, a defense check, which is unilateral in all forms of Dungeons and Dragons in all forms of tabletop role playing, that you have to put a star there, or you need to go from the from the from the Wizards of the Coast trademark uh, copyrighted uh, 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 SRD. It's so fucking stupid. That is so ridiculous. No one, nothing, not even, oh my god, no one holds to these standards in any industry, let alone in gaming. Other parts of the new OGL document create a tiered system of categorizing licensees based on their revenues from commercialized work under the updated OGL. Okay, this segment is going to be a little bit accounting heavy, so please forgive me. 
that the segment we're about to go into is going to have some jargon. I'm going to try and do a summary of it at the end, but it's important that we go through all of this because this is Drama Mama. This is where we go through all the receipts. We do the deep dives, so you're not missing anything. So you know exactly what's going on in just a few, uh, a, quick, a quick video, or well, not a quick video, but in a single video. Here we go. Will OGL publishers have to pay royalties? Probably not. Probably. Now, I don't know if you guys, I, 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 most people are not gonna take a risk on a probably. They're not, most people are not gonna take a risk on possibly getting sued by a international mega corporation. Some people will, and some people will get away with it, but a lot of people are just gonna say, nah, that's fucking annoying. But let's continue. Unless they are making over $750,000, licensees get to keep the money they earn. But the new OGL states that the commercial agreement covers all commercial uses, whether they're profitable or not. Now get this. If you go into the red on a Kickstarter that earned 800 k in backing money, you still owe Wizards of the Coast money, regardless of the fact that you did not profit from your venture. Now, people who are not super familiar with Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or any of these tabletop things might not know this, but but Kickstarters are Kickstarters and Indiegogo campaigns have created an uncountably large amount of enormous projects that were many of them licensed under the open gaming license. I'm talking people making full sets of like uh, like. Uh, D and D themed, uh, like, uh, uh, what are they called? Models, like, so that you can have like a like like for example. Remember how I mentioned that really famous Dungeons and Dragons Curse of Strahd? Well, imagine if you did a Kickstarter project under the open game license to create a a model, a tabletop model uh, of the Curse of Strahd, and you made this, and you it was going to cost. Uh, you know, a million dollars to produce hundreds and hundreds of these so that people could buy them for a couple thousand dollars each and your project just didn't, it didn't make money in the end. Maybe people love the product, maybe it succeeded. You would fucking own, you would fucking, uh, in this new one, you would owe money to Wizard, Wizards of the Coast. These types of projects are everywhere. If you go on Kickstarter and Indiegogo right now, you will find ongoing campaigns for Dungeons and Dragons open game license themed stuff made by people to enhance their own and their friends and the people who are interested in their own little private things. And the thing that's so annoying about this is that most of D&D is not played in a, you know, it's not played uh, 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 like at a big event. It's not played by a megacorp Corporation. It's random people trying to have fun at home in their own kitchens with their friends and they buy sometimes even splurging a lot of money on nice things to make that friend that that social experience good and and Wizards of the Coast is pointing a gun at them. They're pointing at the people that make this possible. There have been countless small, and when I say small, when you hear $750,000 your brain might go, oh my god, that's a ton of money. But when we're talking about people making products that are meant to be uh, sold to like lots of groups of people, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars is not a lot of money uh, to start a to 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 run a a a project off of, especially if it's a high quality project. So basically, Wizards of the Coast is taking aim specifically at Kickstarter projects. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a it's like a rich person robbing a hobo. It's more like it's more like a rich person. Uh, it's like a rich person holding a a like local pastry shop owner, like a, like a tiny little like hole in the wall pastry shop that makes nice pastries, and they're holding the pastry shop. Uh, person hostage so that the people in the pastry shop will give money to the, the the rich person. That's what it is. They're literally targeting these small projects that are designed. These small projects aren't targeted at commercial ventures. They're targeted at hobbyists. That's who's that's who buys these Kickstarter projects. These these thousands of Kickstarter products that are made to enhance your at home game of D and D. Let's continue. Note that if you appear to have achieved great success from producing OGL commercial contents, we may reach out to you for a more custom and mutually beneficial licensing agreement. 
The document notes indicating that Wizards of the Coast is open to creating custom contracts and agreements, but at their discretion. This could indicate that subsidized competition, quote unquote, like Pathfinder, might not get a great deal. Let's take a look at the actual revenue tiers. A, the initiate tier. If you have registered at least one licensed work, but haven't generated $50,000 or more in total gross revenue, notice that, gross revenue, from the OGL, commercial products in a given year, you are at the initiate tier. B, intermediate tier, if your licensed work have generated more than 50, but, but less than 750,000, you are at the intermediate tier. Expert tier, if your licensed works have generated at least 750,000 in total revenue in a given year, you are in the expert tier, according to them. According to the docket, document, if and only if you are generating a significant amount of money, over $750,000 per year across all licensed works from your licensed works, the revenue you make from your licensed work in excess of $750,000 is considered qualifying revenue. And you are responsible for paying us, Wizards of the Coast, 20 to 25% of that qualifying revenue. So... They're gonna explain it here. The draft goes on to explain that if you make $750,000 and $1, you will owe Wizards of the Coast 25 cents, as they are only asking for royalties on the $1 made in excess of the expert tier. As stated in their document in December, Wizards of the Coast suspects that less than 20 companies are at the expert tier. Now that's another interesting line. So we're gonna talk about two things with regard to this real quick, okay? First uh, of all, there are two things going on here. So. Uh, first of all, they kind of admit something there. As stated in their announcement in December, Wizards of the Coast suspects that less than 20 companies are at the expert tier, which brings back what I mentioned earlier. Does this not seem like it is specifically designed to target companies that they believe are their competitors? It, it's basically time trying to pull the rug out from people who've done as good as or better than them. It's very weird. They suspect there's only 20 companies doing this, and yet they create recreated an entire license, almost like they're trying to, I don't know, make it really hard for their competition to succeed. Almost like they're trying to stifle competition. Almost like they're trying to monopolize. Um, but on top of that, I want you to understand the scope of this. What they are trying to say is that you owe them royalties for using a document that was published and published publicly to the entire world in 2002, I think was the original published date. I, I, I may be slightly wrong on the OG, OGL original published date. The one we were looking at earlier was an update from 20, 2004. So what they're trying to say is that, so I want you, I want to try and analogize this. Imagine, hmm, how do I do this? Hmm. What, what's the uh, what's the way that I do this? God, I don't even know what a, what a what a fair version is. Okay, I got an idea. Imagine you're working on a group project with a friend, okay? And your friend, uh, you and your friend uh, are working on this group project, right? And and you're coming up with all these ideas, and you've got like a whole notebook full of cool ideas. And your friend comes over and's like, I got a great idea. Here's what here's a really cool thing. Let's let's. Let's do, uh, let's make sure that in all of the stuff that we do, this little piece that I've designed is going to, it, it will make sure that we can, we can move forward. Maybe they've, uh, maybe they came up with a, uh, like a super cool name or something like that. Like they said, wow, this is a cool name. And you said, buddy, that's awesome. Let's do that. And so you keep working on it and your friend dies. I'm sorry, this is a sad analogy. Your friend passes away and uh, and you have this one piece of the story, this maybe it's a name or a name is a bad example, but whatever, let's pretend it's a name. This name that you carry through, you're writing a book and you've now been writing for 15 years. You've been writing all these amazing stories and it incorporates that piece from your friend that your friend gave you 15 years ago. And you credit him in the beginning and you love him and you're like, I love my friend. But your friend in his will, Left his left all of his intellectual property, all of his holdings and ownership to his boyfriend. And his boyfriend really doesn't like you. And his boyfriend is super, super greedy. And his boyfriend says, hey, you owe me money now. 
You've been you've been soloing this project. You've written 15 books in the series. There's a movie deal. You've got a you've got merch and everything. You've made this whole amazing world of stuff and people love it. You've been making it. But because you incorporated this one piece 15 years ago, you owe me 25% royalties in perpetuity. Pretty shitty, right? You are resp if you, the revenue you make from the licensed works on the OGL, which now the old one is no longer valid. According to them, you have to accept the new one. You're responsible for paying us 20 to 25% of that qualifying revenue. A fourth of the thing that you alone or you and your team, whoever the people are, have to pay that back to a gigantic corporation that has done nothing. In fact, this is the first time they've ever changed anything to do with that license. They created that license to help themselves many years ago because their product wasn't popular. They needed their, po their product to become more popular, so they invited people to use the basic, to use the tiny basic, to, to go and create all kinds of new things, and now they want you to pay for it. For shit they didn't do. They didn't do any of it. It's so bad. Killjoy points out a huge swash of the D&D of the writing team were hired because of the OGL. Yes, the amount of money, the amount of, of popularity and fame that, that, that Wizards of the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons as a whole uh, received was because of the OGL. D&D would not be a worldwide phenomenon if it wasn't for the OGL. The OGL led to the creation of Pathfinder. It led to the creation of of it it led to the creation of D, D fifth edition it led to the creation of critical role it led to the creation of dimension 20 it led to the creation of a thousand other geeky shows that have existed forever it's led to entire conventions and now some fucking uh corporate suits which we're going to get into that in just a minute too uh want you to pay them because of something they didn't do. They didn't touch any of this. No Wizards of the Coast employee ever helped Paizo uh, create all of the beautiful worlds that they create. And by the way, when I'm talking about them creating entire beautiful worlds, there are, there are hundreds of books of genuine art made by all of these other people who were operating under a license in, in good faith. I, I mean, stuff you, you've never even seen. I, I went to a convention. I have, a fa I have an artist that I really like. Uh, uh, Wayne Reynolds uh, is his name. He's a artist for Pathfinder, is where he gained a lot of his fame, but he's also done, uh, he's done art for Wizards of the Coast. And the art that he creates is genuinely breathtaking, okay? Some of you know this guy, many of you maybe don't. But the art that he creates is breathtaking, and I fucking love his art. His art, uh, uh, his art was made possible because of the OGL. His art is, is something that deserves, that, that not only deserves to exist, but deserves to have more people see it. And Wizards of the Coast is taking aim at trying to scoop all of this up because it happened to have uh, a connection to this this license that they originally granted, but they're doing a takesies backsies on. Let's continue. We got to get through this. Let's continue. Who has to register to work with Wizards of the Coast? The updated OGL says that no matter what tier you are in or how much money you believe your product will make, you must register with us any new licensed work you intend to offer for sale, including a description of the licensed work. We'll also ask for your contact info, interesting, information on where you intend to publish the licensed work, its price, and other things. Giant data collection as well. Creators will also be required to use a specific badge in order to publicly and obviously identify their work as covered by the updated OGL. Do you guys remember when I said that this was a this was designed to invalidate uh, products of their competitors on a completely frivolous and stupid thing? They are now making a part of the new one. You have to have a specific new badge and they will not approve if you don't display that badge, which means all of the old works legally published under the OGL, they, they can't display the old OGL badge anymore because, well, or at least they're not supposed to because that has been deemed uh, 
no, no longer existing. This is a significant change from the original OGL, which allowed creators to publish without reporting. Obviously, that's a huge burden to put on any publisher to say that you have to personally report to a, a, a global mega corporation so that you can make your little thing to play with your friends or so you can make your little thing to make a couple quick bucks off because you had a really good D&D &D idea. While it makes sense that Wizard wants to monitor who is using the open game content, this feels like an impossible task. People are selling their work across dozens of platforms, and sometimes one product is being sold on multiple platforms. Whatever the reporting system looks like, the biggest burden will be on the smallest creators. Biggest burden on the smallest creators. Kickstarter, this is where it gets really weird, okay? This is one of the weirdest things that you're going to see. Online crowdfunding is a new phenomenon since the original OGL was created. The new license attempts to address how and where these fundraising campaigns can take place. The OGL 1.1 states that if creators are members of the expert tier, if your licensed work is crowdfunded or sold via any platform other than Kickstarter, you will pay a 25% royalty on qualifying revenue. And if your licensed work is crowdfunded on Kickstarter, our preferred crowdfunding platform, you will only pay a 20% royalty on qualifying revenue. They're literally, Wizards of the Coast is so, is so driven at this power grab attempt that they are even trying to command which crowdfunding sites their people use. You will lose, according to them, an additional 5% money. They will take 5% more from you if you don't publish with their partner, Kickstarter. This means the updated OGL is directly encouraging Kickstarter over any other platform, including private company sites, as any non-Kickstarter revenue over 20, 200, or 750K will incur a 25% royalty. John Ritter, director of games at Kickstarter, oh yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Kickstarter has so many tabletop game fundraisers on it, they have a directorship position just for games at Kickstarter. That's how many games are kickstarted on Kickstarter and similar sites. John Ritter, director of games at Kickstarter, responded on Twitter saying that Kickstarter was contacted after Wizards of the Coast decided to make the OGL changes. So we felt the best move forward was to advocate for creators in the best way we could, which we did. We managed to get a lower percentage plus more being discussed. There's no hidden benefits, no financial kickbacks for, kick, for Kickstarter. This is their license, not ours. Now, that's only half true. Obviously, there is a giant kickback. The kickback being that you are going to receive every single Kickstarter for every person who wants to operate under this new license. So yeah, that's a bit of a kickback. I know that it's not it's not a it's not a kickback in that they're not giving you literal cash. They're just saying, well, everyone's going to choose you, so don't you want to be the guy? It does feel like nepotism or or something similar. It's definitely a it's definitely a shady deal. And also notice this. Kickstarter was contacted after Wizards of the Coast decided to make the OGL changes. This implies here that Kickstarter was under the impression that this change was not a draft, which I know that we haven't gone over yet the draft claim, but we will. The claim was that the leaked document was just a draft, that they weren't actually going to publish it in its current state, which we now, we now are seeing the evidence that that is not true. I'm pointing these out so that we can have them in our mind when we reach the coping portion of this uh, stream. There is a section in the updated OGL dedicated to conditions surrounding crowdfunding. Even for the initiate and intermediate tiers, there are strings attached to using any crowdfunding platform, not just Kickstarter, to get a project off the ground. The two main points are that you may only crowdfund the production of licensed works, or else they'll try to sue you, is the impl implication there, and that no infringing materials are given out as perks or rewards. That means that they even want control over the perks that you give out for backers. <sighs> the power is back at Wizards of the Coast. Well, it's attempted. 
While there is plenty more to parse, the main takeaway from the leaked OGL 1.1 draft document is that the WOTC, or is that Wizards of the Coast, is keeping power close at hand. There is no mention of perpetual worldwide, worldwide rights given to creators. This was present, as we know, it was a main part of, of Section 4 of the OGL. One of the caveats is that the company, thou get this one of the caveats is that the company can modify or terminate this agreement for any reason whatsoever provided we give a 30 days notice insane insane so previously the ogl was a perpetual license the company was saying we want you to make dnd stuff now they're saying we can revoke your license and make your products uh and make all those stamps uh false advertisement within 30 days do you know how impossible that would be if you are a small printer and for some reason you you have no choice in the matter for some reason wizards of the coast gets pissed off at you they can revoke the things that you just printed literally could put you out of business instantly wizards of the coast also gets the right right to use any content that licensees create ah uh, yes this this right here is totally fucked, okay? Wizards of the Coast gets the rights to use any content that licensees create, whether commercial or non-commercial. Although this is couched in language to protect Wizards products from infringing on creators' copyright, the document states that for any content, any content created under the updated OGL, regardless of whether or not it's owned by the creator, Wizards will have a non-exclusive, perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, sub-licensable, royalty-free license to use that content for any purpose. They can steal from you. You draw a really, really cool painting of your D&D character, your D&D character which was played in a D&D campaign under the OGL license, guess what? They can take that and put that character on a shirt and they can do whatever the fuck they want with it according to this license. Do you know how off the absolute rails that is? You, you, you design a cool type of playmat for your friends to play with. Uh, and that's, remember, this includes non-commercial as well. Anybody who makes anything under the OGL is subject to having it taken and used at will by Wizards of the Coast whenever the fuck they want. If that thing touched the OGL, it has made the OGL a invasive virus. The OGL in, in, in the draft state is an invasive virus that that basically takes anything that you create with it and throws it into the trash. Or at least I should say opens the door for it to be thrown into the trash. Again, Wizards has a non-exclusive, perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, sub-licensable, royalty-free license to use that content for any purpose. What this basically says is that unless you are okay with the potential for Wizards of the Coast taking and using anything that you create for whatever reason, you should not touch the OGL, is what this says. Yep, and as Killjoy says, if it's on the internet in plain view, which basically everything is, they will attempt to steal it and the onus is on you to be able to sue for your IP. And you might not, you might not win. Let's continue because we're almost to the end of this article. There are a lot of implications in this extended policy and the ramifications of this updated OGL could have a chilling effect on new licensed products. It will, there's no doubt about it. As, the, as only static products are included, all work that publishers do for virtual tabletops may have to be offered as non-commercial free products, which of course can be used by Hasbro at any time, which de-incentivizes their production. The royalties associated with any company making above 750K could also prompt publishers to hold back extra products or scale down their projects so that they stay under the expert tier. That means it's literally discouraging you from having success. Wizards of the Coast is clearly expecting these OGL changes to be met with some resistance. The document does note that if the company oversteps, they are aware that they will receive community pushback and bad PR. We're more than open to being convinced that we made a wrong decision. By the way, that's in referral to, the, to, to their plan to be aggressive with IP. What that is referring to, 
uh, if the company oversteps, aka if they sue somebody wrongfully, we expect to get pushback. Literally a cop out. Now, if you can believe it, that's just what happened at the initial launch. There has been a considerable amount of uh, conflict since then, okay? So let me just talk about some of the backlash that has been received. Uh, some of the biggest publishers, including both Paizo and uh, Kobold Press. Kobold Press uh, doesn't just, doesn't, isn't, isn't a part of Paizo. Kobold Press publishes things for many different tabletops, but they publish a lot of stuff specifically for D&D. Kobold Press is very big. Uh, uh, Paizo, Kobold Press uh, have both spoken out, uh, 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 have both spoken out massively against this. I mean, they're saying, like, this is terrible. I can give you an example of this. Let me just show you what, uh, what Kobold Press had to say about it. Like I said, Kobold Press is a, a very large publisher that uses the OGL license, or used the OGL license. Let me just give you this real quick. Raising our flag. So here's a statement by Kobold Press. If it'll load, we'll see if it loads. I wasn't expecting that. Wasn't expecting it to not load. Okay, well, I guess we're not getting that one. Looks like their site's down. Uh, regardless, uh, regardless, I, ha I read it earlier already, and let me tell you, it is a resounding, a absolutely resounding denouncement of the policy. A huge, huge D&D content creator. Uh, Matt Mercer, uh, now this one's a little funny, okay? Matt Mercer uh, uh, did not make any public statement as of yet. However, if you are to go and look at Matt Mercer's likes on Twitter, which both myself and my researcher Silent did, you will discover that Matt Mercer has been liking a lot, a lot of, of, uh, of uh, anti, anti new license uh, uh, tweets, okay? Let's just put it that way, okay? Oh, and actually, here you go. This is actually, it looks like they did. Uh, yesterday night, they released, they did release a statement. Let's take a look. This is from Critical Role, from all of us over at Critical Role. Now, for those of you who don't know, Critical Role is, I believe, the largest and most well-funded Dungeons & Dragons uh, themed podcast in, in the world. It is a in, in unbelievably uh, famous show uh, that is incredibly original. They run a homebrew campaign based on D and D stuff. They actually have real partnerships, like like formal agreements for publishing with Wizards of the Coast. And this is what they had to say: Am I breaking the timeline? How am I breaking the timeline? Oh, I am breaking the timeline. Oh yeah, I should not break the timeline. Sorry about that. I just wanted to say. This has been, this is something that came back. You are correct, this is breaking the timeline. Thank you for the catch. Point is, uh, yeah. Cobalt press statement is on the internet archive. Oh, thank God. We can read that one. That one is in the timeline. Oh, is it back up now? No, it's not loading for me, but here, we can look at this one. Here we go. This was from the, really? 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 Here we go. To our fellow kobolds, the kobold press has always been and always will be committed to open gaming in the tabletop community. Our goal, stop it, is to continue creating the best materials for players and game masters alike. Uh, notice they use the term game master. That is that is the uh, uh, Wizards of the Coast has actually copyrighted the term dungeon master. So uh, the term game master has to be used elsewhere. Uh, this means Kobold Press will release its current Kickstarter projects as planned, including campaign builders, cities and towns already printed and on its way to backers this winter. In particular, Deep Magic Volume 2 will remain fully compatible with 5e rules. We are wor working with our virtual tabletop partners to maintain support for digital platforms. As we look ahead, it becomes even more important for our actions to represent our values. While we wait to see what the future holds, we are moving forward with a clear-eyed work on a new core fantasy tabletop rule set. Available, open, and subscription free uh, for those who love it. Code name Project Black Flag. 
All kobolds look forward to the continued evolution of tabletop gaming. We aim to play our part in making the game better for everyone. Rest assured, Kobold Press intends to maintain a strong presence in the tabletop RPG community. We are not going anywhere. So this is one of the biggest publishers, and they are saying we will no longer be using D&D related stuff. We are going to publish our own entire system. Pretty based. Okay? So, now, to continue the timeline, after the article that we just read was published, we received a response from Dungeons and Dragons, okay? So, get this. this. This document leaks, and it is radio silence from Dungeons and Dragons. Then, Dungeons and Dragons Beyond, like I mentioned, the aforementioned subscription service, the official account for D&D Beyond makes a tweet. We know that you have questions about the OGL, and we will be sharing more soon. Thank you for your patience. So they had a document that was originally intended to give companies seven days uh, of response time. Companies that are largely working in printed media, companies that uh, uh, have to invest a lot to sell physical media, they were going to give them seven days to respond to it or else risk legal action. And then their best response is, thank you for your patience, we'll talk about it more soon. So then uh, there was another leak, I believe, if I'm not mistaken here. Yes, then there was a leak. So the first thing got leaked and then there was a second leak. Now this leak is of a different nature. This leak was a, a was leaked by someone at Wizards. This was confirmed by numerous sources and this was an internal uh, message. And I want you to look at this, here we go. Here's this right here. Huge leak from an insider at Wizards. It's what we feared. The higher ups despise us, the D&D community and see us only as an obstacle to their money. Let's take a look. This is This was, according to the source, a email uh, memorandum that was sent around. Uh, or sorry, this was a summary that was sent. Hi, I'm an employee at Wizards of the Coast currently working on D&D Beyond and with the D&D business leaders on the health... Uh, yes, here, this is the leak right here. Uh, here you go. There you go. I am an employee at Wizards of the Coast, so this is somebody who's working for the company. This is somebody who uh, is working with business leaders. They are clearly in a position of, of influence to some degree. If you want, I can provide proof of this, of course. Many journalists confirmed this. I'm sending this message because I fear for the health of a community I love, and I know what leaders at w Wizards of the Coast are currently looking at. They are briefly delaying the rollout of the OGL changes due to the backlash. Okay, listen to this closely. Their decision-making is based entirely on the provable impacts to their bottom line. Specifically, they are looking at D&D Beyond subscriptions and cancellations as it is the quickest financial data that they currently have access to. They are still hoping the community forgets, moves on, and they can still push this through. I have decided to reach out because at my time at Wizards of the Coast, I have never once heard management refer to customers in a positive manner. Their communication gives me the impressions that they see customers as obstacles between them and their money. The D&D Beyond team was first told to prepare to support the new OGL changes and the online porting portal when they got back from the holidays. So there is so much information in this email that we have to go over with. Oh, well, I hope you have a great time, Killjoy. Uh, leadership doesn't take any responsibility for the pain and stress they cause others. Leadership's first communication to the rank and file on OGL was 30 minutes was 30 minutes on the 11th. Was for 30 minutes on the 11th. This is the first time they even tried to communicate their intentions about the OGL to other employees, and even in this meeting, they blamed the community's overreaction. I repeat, the main thing this leadership is looking at at DB is is at D and D Beyond subscription cancellations. Hopes your day goes well. P.S. I will be copying and pasting this message to other community leaders. Now again, we have had numerous journalists go on the record to say that they confirmed this person's identity. As far as we can tell, this is a genuinely concerned employee uh, with some level of influence at, at, uh, uh, at Wizards of the Coast, specifically in D&D Beyond.
Uh, oh, very helpful information. Shadow Angel 9 thank you very much for this. I didn't actually know this. Kobold Press isn't just a third-party publisher. Kobold P Press literally designed the Horde of the Dragon Queen, Rise of Tiamat, and the Ghost of Salt March. They were the fr they were the company that made the first licensed D and D Fifth Edition campaigns. Holy shit! I didn't actually know that fact. That small that that fact. That's actually also incredibly relevant. That that just goes. By the way, that just goes even further, okay? As Grime Dango says in chat, we can now tell that the OGL draft was not a draft. It was sent to people to sign. Uh, it was, it was, uh, yes, we did cover that. And we know this because Kickstarter said that they agreed to it as well. So we know this wasn't just a draft, even though you will now see that, uh, that uh, Dungeons and Dragons as we're about to get into, they are going to claim that this was just a draft that wasn't ready for public consumption. But in the truth, behind closed doors, they were having people sign it already. This wasn't a draft. They were intended to go forward with this heinous nightmare uh, completely un un undiscouraged. So this was the leak, okay? The leak occurred, and then... And then some major shit went down, okay? Because once that leak went out, a lot of people got mad. Okay, let's take a look at this. They're scared. D&D &D Beyond canceled the live stream that was planned for the 12th. So two days ago, there was a planned live stream and they canceled it at the last minute. Even Wizards employees are coming out to say how much they hate what Wizards of the Coast are doing in the OGL 1.1. Creators hate it, the community hate it, the people even at Wizards of the Coast hate it, and yet still nothing. The canceled stream may may not actually be related to the OGL. It's impossible to know. The, apparently they forgot to tell the community this stream had ended. Well, I don't know. That's pretty weird. True or not, the fact remains that they can't they can't put that they can put together a response to this tweet saying, "Oh, that stream wasn't happening," but not to the situation at hand. AKA, they're communicating about other things but they refuse to acknowledge the issues at hand. Okay? So this by the way, let me just let me just go in here real quick and explain something to you. So at this point in time, this was two days ago, there has been uh, a widespread, and when I say widespread, I mean uh, basically every uh, every person that every every content creator that makes Wizards of the Coast product related uh, uh, content that I know of personally, I've seen them. Uh, urge people to cancel D and D Beyond. I have seen more tweets about people canceling D and D Beyond than I've seen for any other boycott in recent memory. I mean, people are going hard. There is a lot of cancellations of D and D Beyond right now, um, which is being led by a lot of people uh, who are uh, who, the only people who aren't able to do this are people who are in contracts with Dungeons and Dragons. For example. Critical Role. And as it turns out, as I kind of spoilered, it looks like Critical Role has made a statement, even though they, they obviously didn't tell anybody to boycott D&D &D Beyond. Uh, according to multiple sources, there was supposed to be a video published on 3 p.m. on Thursday. The people reporting this include OG Pathfinder writers. I'm not sure about that. I, don't, I have not seen that, but I do believe that it is possible that they're hiding this, uh, that they're basically trying to wait for it to blow over. Okay, so real quick, this is something we need to drop in here because this is on the timeline. Remember Paizo? Mentioned them a couple times. Paizo, the publishers of Pathfinder, who uh, many, many years ago published a, a, started their publication and their entire fantasy universe, which in my opinion is an amazing fantasy universe of incredible quality. Uh, I play, I have played so much Pathfinder, it's not even, it's not even funny. Uh, it, they, they made a statement about this. We have announced a plan for a system neutral open RPG license in collaboration with other game companies. We believe that it will be irrevocably and unquestionably keep alive the spirit of the open game license. Learn more. Paizo announces system neutral open RPG license. For the last several weeks, as rumors of Wizards of the Coast's new version of the open game license began circulating among publishers and on social media, gamers across the world have been asking what Paizo plans to do in light of concerns regarding Wizards of the Coast's rumored plan to deauthorize the existing OGA, OGL 1.0A. 
We have been awaiting further information, hoping that Wizards would realize that for more than 20 years, the OGL has been a mutually beneficial license which should not and cannot be revoked. While we, while we continue to await an answer from Wizards of the Coast, we strongly feel that Paizo can no longer delay in making our own feelings about the importance of open gaming as a part of, pub, uh, a part of the public discussion. We believe that any interpretation of the OGL 1.0 or 1.0a were intended to be uh, uh, revocable or able to be deauthorized is incorrect, with good reason. We were there. Paizo owner Lisa Stevens and Paizo president Jim Butler were leaders on the Dungeons and Dragons team at Wizards at the time of the publication of the OGL license. Brian Lewis, co-founder of Azora Law, the intellectual property firm that Paizo uses, was the attorney for Wizards of the Coast who came up with the legal framework for the OGL itself. Paizo has also worked very closely on the OGL related issues with Ryan Dancy, the visionary who conceived the OGL in the first place. Now I want you to understand that this is, this statement right here is like the ultimate flex. Having all of the people or all of the core people who are involved in actually creating that license on your hand to say, this is some bullshit, you are destroying what we tried to create, that is it is, ooh, now you see, now you see why I had to cook and serve you up this beautiful drama mama. Do you see how juicy this gets? Yet, yeah, as Grime Dango says, it's also very interesting that all of these people no longer work at Wizards of the Coast, that they all got out how rancid it must actually be at Wizards of the Coast. It is interesting, isn't it? Let's continue, though. Let's do it. Paizo does not believe that the OGL 1.0a can be deauthorized ever. While we are prepared to argue that point in a court of law if need be, we do not want to have to do that. And we know that many of our fellow publishers are not in a position to do so. This is so based. This is Paizo basically going, we'll sue you if we have to, but we know that a lot of really good people in this industry don't have the means to sue. And that is some bullshit. That is some, that is some based ass uh, 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 addressing of the issues by Paizo, I gotta say. We have no interest whatsoever in Wizards' new OGL. Good! Instead, we have a plan that we believe will irre irrevocably and unquestionably keep alive the spirit of the open game license. As Paizo has evolved, the parts of the OGL that we, that we ourselves value has changed. When we needed to quickly bring out the Pathfinder first edition to continue publishing our popular monthly adventures back in 2008, using Wizard's language was important and expeditious. But in our non-RPG products, including our Pathfinder Tales novels, the Pathfinder Adventure card game, and others, we shifted our focus away from the D&D tropes to lean harder into ideas from our own writers, also based. By the time we went to work on Pathfinder 2nd Edition, Wizards of the Coast's open game content was significantly less important to us, and so our designers and developers wrote the new edition without using any of Wizards' copyrighted expressions of any game mechanics. Now, we're gonna watch a video at the end of this that explains what this means. But remember how I said, um, remember how I said that you can't actually copyright rules? You can actually only copyright a specific uh, way of saying the rules. So it is, you're not actually allowed uh, in American law to copyright a method or a rule set. You can only copyright your version of the rule set. So if you change the words, if you change the way that it's stated, it's not copyrightable. That is not something that you can claim copyright on. Rules are not something that is, um, that is overseen by American copyright law. Uh, Delance says that the, all of these people were, were uh, fired or let go by the 4th edition team, which was placed there by Hasbro. Well, you all recall what happened with 4th edition, right? 4th edition moved to a different proprietary license. This is an even more aggressive move than that. Uh, Fourth edition was just was 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 D and D basically saying, well, we're not gonna we're not gonna use the OGL anymore. We're gonna license all of our projects on a proprietary license. Now they're actually going even, as we've seen, they're going even harder. They're trying to claim past work.
Yes, exactly. Crime Dango says in the ninth in the nineteen nineties, Nintendo was suing rental stores for copying for cop like for like photocopying instruction booklets. So bam, a cottage industry of companies that made rental safe instruction booklets popped up. You see how that works? The rules are not copyrightable, only one version of the rules. You can just write your own version that says basically the same thing but in different words, and it's totally legal. Let's continue. Uh, how does this relate to IP and pharma companies? Very complicatedly, in a way that a lawyer would have to explain. Let's continue. We believe, as we always have, that open gaming make ga makes games better, improves the profitability for everyone involved, and enriches the community of gamers who participate in this amazing hobby. And so we invite gamers from around the world to join us as we begin the next great chapter of open gaming with the release of a new, open, perpetual, and irrevocable. Notice how harshly they're saying that. Open RPG creative license, the orc. Aw, that's cute. The new open RPG creative license will be a, will be built system agnostic for independent game publishers under the legal guidance of Azora Law, an intellectual property law firm that represents Paizo and several other game publishers. Paizo will pay for this legal work. We invite game publishers worldwide to join us in the support of this system agnostic license that allows all games to provide their own unique open rules reference documents that open up individual game systems to the world. To join the effort and provide feedback, please sign up by using this form. In addition to Paizo, Kobold Press, Chaosium, Green Ronin, Legendary Games, uh, Rogue Genius Games, and a growing list of publishers have already agreed to participate in the Open RPG Creative License, and in the coming days, we hope and expect to add substantially to this group. The Orc will not be owned by Paizo, nor will it be owned by any company who makes money publishing RPGs. Azora's Law's ownership of the process and stewardship should provide a safe harbor against any company being bought, sold, or changing management in the future, and a attempting to rescind rights or nullify sections of the license. Ultimately, we plan to find a nonprofit with a history of open source values to own this license, such as the Linux Foundation. Of course, Paizo plans to continue publishing Pathfinder and Starfinder, even as we move away from open, the open game license. Since months of work uh, since months worth of product are still at the printer, you will see the familiar OGL 1.0A in the back of our products for a while yet. While the open RPG creative license is being finalized, we'll be printing Pathfinder and Starfighter products without any license, and we'll add the finished license to those products when the new pro license is complete. We hope that you will continue to support Paizo and other game pu publishers in this difficult time for the entire hobby. You can do your part by supporting the many companies that have provided content under the OGL. Support Pathfinder and Starfinder by visiting your local game store, subscribing online, etc., etc., etc. All of these publishers are working to pre preserve a prosperous future for open gaming that is both perpetual and irrevocable. We will be there at your side. You can count on us to not go back on our word forever. I gotta say, I am very impressed. I'm very impressed with the approach that Paizo has taken on this. Uh, uh, creating a a genuinely, permanently unassailable open game license is indeed a step forward. Uh, th that one portion that we read at the very beginning, remember this, at the very beginning of this stream? Wizards of the Coast wrote the license and wants to control the right to make changes to the license in the future. That will not be present in this version because changes to the license will be handled by a nonprofit. AD5D2D Derek uh, points out, from chat points out, Microsoft tried to do this to Linux in the early 2000s and the backlash was so ferocious that Microsoft became a synonym for evil at the time. A thousand open source projects bloomed in the aftermath and it still continues to shape the software industry to this day. We can hope that a, such a positive effect will be present now. Okay, everybody. So we, we got to take a small break to enjoy a positive step, a... a a company that is actually doing something to make sure that all of us can continue playing the wonderful tabletop games that so many of us uh, enjoyed. However, we got some more evil to go through. We finally did indeed receive a response from Wizards of the Coast. That's right. Literally yesterday, Wizards of the Coast finally responded. Now, you might note 
that Wizards of the Coast didn't respond for days upon days upon days, that they were ignoring emails from journalists, that they were ignoring emails from major figures in the community of... I should be clear about something. When I say major figures of the community, D&D &D is a product that does not exist without a community. I mean that. D&D &D cannot exist without community figures to run the games. It is a game that, by the rules, requires multiple players to play. It requires community leaders who are willing to take the time to put together a session. D&D &D is a high-effort hobby. It is a high-effort hobby even for players. Uh, and when, when, when you have community leaders, people who are putting a lot of effort making the product an, a thing that anybody wants to buy, who are concerned and are being ignored, that is a massive failure. And it's interesting to me that we only got a response from Dungeons and Dragons official account of any type, besides the, we'll talk to you eventually about it, was after there was a gigantic boycott and a push for people, large followings of D&D players, to cancel D&D Beyond. Isn't that interesting? Oh, uh, uh, Timmy the Cutie. Oh, don't you worry. We're gonna talk about Cynthia Williams. Oh, we're gonna talk about Cynthia Williams. But we gotta get through the timeline first, because this has been a very long timeline so far. Let's listen to their response, shall we? the response that came after people started canceling tons of D&D Beyond subscriptions. Here we go. An update on the open game license by the D&D Beyond staff. When we initially conceived of revising the OGL, it was with three major goals in mind. First, we wanted the ability to prevent the use of D&D content from being included in hateful and discriminatory products. Remember when I said that the uh, that whole thing of the the being able to revoke the license from hateful and discriminatory products uh, was kind of a weird was kind of a weird move for them to do. Notice how they open the letter with that. It almost it just it, it feels a little strange, doesn't it? Doesn't that doesn't that feel a little bit manipulative? It feels manipulative to me, at least. I don't know if everybody else agrees with me on that, but I think that feels manipulative. Second, we wanted to address those attempting to use D&D &D in Web3 blockchain games and NFTs by making clear that OGL content is limited to tabletop role-playing content like campaigns, modules, and supplements. Also, a very weird thing. It's weird that uh, it's weird that they only care about the blockchain NFT Web three stuff now that there's uh, you know some serious criminal scandals going on. It's it's weird. It's almost like they're trying to capitalize on progressive values and they're trying to capitalize on NFT stuff by putting those two as the reasons they were redoing the document. But I, I can't help but feel that the 9,000 word document that they produced really has all that much to do with hateful content and really doesn't have all that much to do with NFTs. In fact, those were two tiny segments in comparison to the total rework of their ownership and claim to uh, money a lot of money, a, a unbelievable pile of Mr. Krabs like money that the rest of the the new OGL uh, attempts to or, or or concerns, it's kind of kind of strange. Oh yeah, also everyone in chat is pointing out that Hasbro makes Power Rangers NFTs. So yeah, it's kind of fucking bullshit. Anyway, third. We wanted to ensure that the OGL is for the content creator, the home brewer, the aspiring designer, our players, and the community, not major corporations to use for their own commercial and promotional purpose. You are a major corporation! What are you talking about? What are you talking about? The document in its current form puts unbelievable pressure on the content creator, the home brewer, the aspiring designer. These are the people most affected. Oh, God.
Let's continue. Driving these goals were two simple principles. Our job to be good stewards of the game, and two, the OGL exists for the benefit of the fans. Nothing about those principles has wavered for a second. I didn't get the feeling at all, at any point, that the OGL 1.1 was created for the fan or the benefit of the fans. In fact, nothing there was talking about making it easier for fans. In fact, all of it was about making it easier and more profitable for Hasbro and not for the fans. Strange. Let's continue, though. That was why our early drafts of the new OGL included the provisions that they did. That draft language was provided to content creators and publishers so their feedback can be considered before anything was finalized. This is the part I was telling you that we now know to be not true. We know that this is a lie. We know, and in fact, we had the pieces all along. The article we were reading from a couple of days ago, which cited, uh, which, which showed that Kickstarter had already agreed shows that this is not a, uh, this wasn't draft language. This was something they were asking people to sign on to in advance. Just lying. In addition to language allowing us to address discriminatory and hateful conduct and clarifying what types of project products the OGL covers, our drafts included royalty language designed to apply to large corporations attempting to use OGL content. They had the right Everyone, including your competitors, your competitors who weren't large corporations when they started, Paizo was a literal garage company. When Paizo started, they had like five people involved. They succeeded because D&D &D blew it. They, not just because of that, obviously, but they became a major corporation because nobody wanted to play D&D &D 4th edition because of how restrictive it was and because there was no content. Because of their own decisions. Let's continue. It was never our intent to impact the vast majority of the community. However, it's clear from the reaction that we rolled a one. <laughs> they rolled a one, guys. Oh my God, they're so nerdy. <laughs> wow, a one? They rolled a one, guys. Wow, that's so funny. I love it when they're attempting to take money from people and they make nice and relatable, ha <laughs> ha, funny, goofball. Love it. It's so cute. Isn't it so cute when the legal team writes in a D&D &D joke so that they can justify and lie to your face about how they're trying to steal money from everybody? Isn't that funny i love it's so funny i love it when people roll a one when they roll a one that's a critical fail you know when you roll the dice and it lands on one that's a fail they're saying they oops fail oop fail moment holy shit yeah what can we say but epic fail bro epic fail for the lose it's literally, it's more intolerable than like fake Zoomer speech where they were like, yeah, you know, you know, we know this was uh, we know this was fatherless behavior. We really took a L here. It would be better if they said that. It would be unironically better if they said that. It's become clear that it's no longer possible to fully achieve all three goals while still ch staying true to our principles. So here's what we are doing. Allowing hate speech. No, just kidding. That's a joke. That, that's a joke, obviously. The next OGL will contain the provisions that allow us to protect and cultivate the inclusive environment we are trying to build and specify that it covers only content for TTRPGs, tabletop RPGs. That means the other expressions, such as educational and charitable campaigns, live streams, cosplay, virtual tabletop uses, etc., will remain unaffected by any OGL update. So they say. Content already released under 1.0a will also remain unaffected. They say. What it will not contain is any royalty structure. It will also not include the license back provision that some people were afraid is a means for us to steal work. Yeah, you, it shouldn't include that because that's criminal. That thought never crossed our minds. Shut the fuck up. This is so stupid. The idea when you said, I mean, can we go back to the wording? Can I, I'm sorry, can I just get, can I just get the actual wording here? Wizards will have a non-exclusive, perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, 
sub-licensable, royalty-free license. That's royalties towards towards the, the creators. They don't have to pay the creators to use that content for any purpose. You're trying to tell us that that thought never crossed our minds? Oh, ha, ha, when we said that we would not have to pay you anything and there would be a worldwide irrevocable license, ha, ha, we were just, that was, we were just being a little ditzy. Ha, ha we were, we were just being a bimbo. Ha, I'm such a bimbo. Ha, our lawyer team was, they were being bimbos. Under any new OGL, you will, of course, you will own the content you create. We won't. Guess what? You don't need an OGL for that to be the case. You don't need an OGL. Uh, you don't need a, 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 a permission slip from, from the overbearing parents at Wor Wizards of the Coast to own the content you create. You own the content you create. The, it's yours. That's, that's how it works. You don't, they don't own it. They never did. Even under the OGL, they never owned that shit. Remember in the beginning of this thing how I said that a lot of this was like a spiritual or emotional struggle? Like that this is a mental struggle with the fan base? That this is designed to basically play psychological games with the fan base? That's what this is. They never owned your shit, ever. Even, even if the OGL hadn't existed, you could have still done those things. All of those things are perfectly legal to do under American law. They just were, they were, the, the point of the OGL was to be like, we're not going to give you shit about it. We're not going to sue you over it. We're not going to make your life hell over it. The OGL isn't even necessary at all, says Grime Dango, uh, to make compatibles. It's just a trust document. Yes, exactly. We're going to actually watch a small segment uh, from Legal Eagle at the end that explains to the, to, the, to the full degree how this works. And I think it's very useful, and I think a lot of people will find it productive. Anyway, let's continue. Any language we put down will be crystal clear and unequivocal on that point. The license back language was intended to protect us and our partners from creators who incorrectly allege that we steal their work simply because of coincidental similarities. Hmm. Hmm. Oops. I didn't mean to break that web page. We wanted to protect ourselves for when we steal. I mean, when we copy. I mean, when we when we plagiarize. I mean, I mean, I mean, when we don't plagiarize and we don't steal. You mean like fucking J.R.R. Tolkien who sued your ass? <laughs> As we continue to invest in the game that we love and move forward with partnerships in film, television, and digital games, that risk is simply too great to ignore. Fuck off. The new OGL will contain provisions to address that risk, but we will do so without a license back and without suggesting we have the rights to the content you create. Good, because that would be illegal. Good, because you don't. That was delusion. It was delusion and bullying. Your ideas and imagination are what makes this game special, and that belongs to you. Again, condescending helicopter parent per permission slip. I I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry, honey. I just wanted you to know you have my permission to go to the bathroom, okay? I, I might stand outside the door, but I just want you to know you have my permission, okay? A couple of last thoughts. First, we won't be able to reach the release the new OGL today because we need to make sure we get it right, but it is coming. Second, you're going to hear people say that we won, that they won, and we lost because making your voices heard forced us to change our plans. This is them directly referencing people unsubscribing from D&D &D Beyond. Those people will only be half right. They won, and so did we. I am Adolf Hitler! 
Our plan was always to solicit the input of our community before any update to the OGL. The the drafts you've seen were attempting to do just that, like that, except they weren't drafts and everybody knows they weren't drafts. We want to always delight fans and create experiences together that everyone loves. We realize we did not do that this time and we are sorry for that. Our goal was to get exactly the type of feedback on which provisions worked and which did not. If that's true, you should have you should have offered this up in a poll. You should have offered this up publicly to people who care and are invested in the game. You should have been open. This should have been published publicly so people could comment on it and it should have been clear that this isn't the direction that it was going. But they know that if they did this as a draft, people would, would not trust them anymore because this is an egregious document. Any change this ma this major could have only been done well if we were willing to take that feedback no matter how it was provided. So we are. Thank you for caring enough to let us know what works and what doesn't, what you need and what scares you. Oh my God. Oh my God. How condescending can they be? How condescending what scares you? God, it's like dripping with malice. Without knowing that, we can't do our part to make the new OGL match our principles. Finally, we'd appreciate the chance to make this right. We love D&D's devoted players and the creators who take them on so many advent incredible adventures. We won't let you down. Isn't that, isn't that just egregious? All right. Now, we have one more piece to drop in the timeline, okay? One more bit to drop in the timeline. That's from this morning. An update. Cancel D&D Beyond subscriptions have forced Hasbro's hand. Dungeons & Dragons publisher Wizards of the Coast finally broke its silent rega silence regarding the game's open game license on Friday. Excuse me. Attempting to calm tensions in the D&D community and answer questions that were raised after Gizmodo broke the news about the contents of a draft of the document last week. In a message title, an update, that's the one we just read it, Wizards of the Coast's official digital toolset, the company addressed many of the concerns raised after the leak of the open gaming license 1.1 earlier in the week and walked them ba back fast. Notable changes include the elimination of royalty structures and the promise to clarify ownership of copyright and intellectual property. But it might be too little too late. Despite reassurances from Hasbro's subsidiary, Wizards of the Coast may have already suffered the consequences of their week of silence. Multiple sources from inside Wizards of the Coast tell Gizmodo that the situation inside the castle is dire, and that Hasbro's concern is less about public image and more about the IP horde that the dragon is sitting on. Bottom line seems to be, after a, a fan-led campaign to cancel D&D Beyond subscriptions went viral, it sent a message to Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro higher-ups. According to multiple sources, these immediate financial consequences were the main thing that forced them to respond. The decision to further delay the rollout of the open gaming license and then adjust the messaging around the rollout occurred because of a provable impact on their bottom line. According to these sources, in meetings and communication with employees, Wizards of the Coast manage ma management's messaging has been that the fans are overreacting to the leaked draft and that in a few months, nobody will remember the uproar. Now, down here, what we're going to see is a couple of examples of publishers. The, the article goes on to give some examples of publishers, etc., etc. Okay? We're not going to read the whole article. But I want to point out the fact that not only has everyone with any sort of history with Wizards of the Coast theorized that they are going to wait for this to blow over and then push through something almost identical to it that is strictly beneficial to them. We know that this is going to happen. But also, people on the Wizards of the Coast team have literally confirmed that that is what is being discussed in the boardrooms and in the meeting rooms at Wizards of the Coast. Actual anonymous team members have come forward to say they are talking about just waiting until no one cares so that we can push this through again. They think you are stupid. Now, there is some there are some things I wanted to discuss with regard to the boycott of of D and D Beyond. Clearly, it gave them a shock to their system, and we now understand as to use their own words, what they are scared of. We understand what you're scared of, Wizards of the Coast, and it only has to do with your bottom line. It has nothing else to do with anything else. Uh, and I would say, this is my personal uh, statement, 
uh, if you if you are one of the people who has who has canceled D and D Beyond, you should remain canceled, no matter what D and D, no matter what Wizards of the Coast tries to do in the coming months, because uh, we have now seen very clearly where all of their leadership, is, where all of their leadership is looking. They are going to find an opportunity to do exactly what they did here, or to restructure it in such a way that they can squeeze all of the money out of everyone. And even if you think that there's good stuff in the game, you should not be supporting D&D Beyond for your own good. Not because of any principled stance. You don't gotta have like some sort of like principled stance on open software. It's just for your own good. You are going to get screwed. Anybody using the OGL knows that this is not a safe document. They are going to invalidate the old OGL. You can't use that shit. You can't trust D&D Beyond. You cannot trust that your products are going to be quality. You cannot trust that they are even going to be yours. And what's worse is now you can't even trust that there will be a community to play them with. If you're dropping 60 to $70 on a book or on a cup or on multiple books for D&D, you're doing that under the under the hope that there will be people who will want to play that with you. Under the hope that there will be a thriving community that you can participate in, that you can enjoy. That's part of the draw of tabletop role playing. It's the community aspect. It's always been one of the core draws of, t of tabletop. But you can't trust that with Wizards, Wizards of the Coast anymore. You simply can't. Th they, are, they are killing, uh, they are killing the community. They have driven away the people who make their community happen. The people who are making stuff for D&D are no longer gonna make it for D&D. Uh, all of these, these publishers are not going to work with Hasbro anymore. They're not gonna work with Wizards of the Coast. Your, that, that community that has been thriving around D&D since fifth edition launched, done. The trust is permanently destroyed especially when the response is as sarcastic, pathetic, manipulative as the one that we just saw. Silence points out, uh, the only reasonable exception is a, ch is a creator who currently needs to use D&D Beyond for your livelihood, but you definitely need to be paying attention to see where the current shifts and be ready to make the shift in advance. Yeah, it would be an absolute disaster if you were if you are somebody who uses D&D Beyond to professionally dungeon, ma uh, dungeon master or any of those things, and all of a sudden, three months from now, you're shit out of luck because they've made an even more draconian and twisted contract, which is clearly what they want to do. They're treating the community like children. You saw what the, can we go back over the leak real quick? The leak, look at the leak, the leaked email. I'm an employee at Wizards of the Coast currently working on D&D &D Beyond and with D&D &D business leaders on the health of the product line. So this is somebody in a pretty high position. And let's just take a look at what they thought, okay? Decision making is based entirely on the provable impact of the bottom line. They are still hoping the community forgets and moves on. Uh, I have decided to reach out because I have never once heard management refer to customers in a positive manner. In their communication gives me the impression they see customers as obstacles between them and their money. Can you imagine working at a company and the entire time you're there, every single leadership position talks about customers with derision? This is another reason why you should consider never buying a D&D product again. Because the best source that we have says that they actually unironically hate you. That they see you as an object and nothing more. Danny Fallen says, damn, D20 and Critical Role should just switch to Pathfinder. Watch Wizards of the Coast go bankrupt because they're already killing uh, Magic the Gathering. Oh yes, we have not even talked about uh, that, but I should note on that. Uh, we, all of what we've been talking about today has been a deep dive on the D&D OGL situation. However, for the last, I mean, a long time, but at least for the last year especially, uh, there has been the same company, Wizards of the Coast, has a project product many of you know of called Magic the Gathering. And let's just say the Magic the Gathering community, which I follow, uh, you know, not super tightly, but relatively closely. I watch, I watch uh, a video by a uh, by a a a 
well, you guys know, I've watched it with you, uh, Alpha Investments, Rudy, uh, he's a, he's a, genuinely, he's got his finger on the pulse of the local game stores. And let me just tell you, the Magic the Gathering community has been utterly decimated. They are literally, Wizards of the Coast has been aggressively, uh, has basically been cutting out local game stores out of the entire process. So like the community is falling apart. There are, in real time, you can watch the Magic the Gathering community fall apart. Every single major community figure has been screaming about Wizards of the Coast attempting to destroy uh, everything that people love about Magic the Gathering for profit, including switching from distribution through local game stores which is vital for the health of a game, to just selling trash bags full of cards, fucking not actual trash bags, but trash bags full of cards on Amazon.com. It is so scummy. You should not trust Wizards of the Coast whatsoever. Yep, from local game stores to Amazon. Now, there's one more thing I wanna, I know that right now I'm kind of going into my end segment where I like, where I start to tell you my thoughts about and my feelings about the situation. And I apologize, usually I'm pretty clear when we're going to that section, but there's one more thing, there's one more thing I wanted to bring up. And then we're gonna do, we're gonna watch a quick video and then we're gonna, uh, and then I'm gonna give you my opinion on the whole, whole situation, okay? Let me just show you something. This is the resume for the current president of Wizards of the Coast, okay? This is the president, Cynthia Williams, okay? I want you to notice where she worked for 12 years. This is a company called Altria. Now, you might be going, well, what the hell is that supposed to mean? Altria Group, moving beyond smoking. A federal court has ordered Altria, RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company, Lollard, and Philip Morris USA to make these statements. Altria is a mega corporation and the world's, one of the world's largest producers and marketers of tobacco, cigarettes, and related products. Let's just, let's just take a look. This is one of the biggest cigarette and tobacco companies in the world. And she was a leadership in leadership positions. She was in directorship positions for 12 years there. But guess what else? She also worked with Amazon. Interesting. Just before going to Wizards of the Coast, she worked for Amazon and parted on good terms with Amazon. And now Wizards of the Coast is aiming to make all of their business go through Amazon instead of local game stores. Local game stores, which are the lifeblood of the actual community. Local game stores are the people who, who put together the gaming nights. They're the people who organize the, the, uh, the championships. They're the people who organize pack opening. They're the people who build the community. And Cynthia Williams has been perpetually aiming to move more and more of, of Magic the Gathering onto Amazon. So it's interesting. It's almost like Cynthia Williams has a history of working for companies that are bottom line focused over everything else, but that's all corporations to a certain degree, and also companies that are ruthless and cutthroat and struggle with their PR image. It's almost like Cynthia Williams is taking the skills she learned working for a global worldwide tobacco company and a global worldwide logistics gi giant with horrible PR and using them to try and squeeze the, uh, the, the, the players of a new game. Isn't that very, very strange? Yeah, the Turbo Karen. Really wild, huh? So now we're going to enter into the part where I give my sort of Un, uh, unfiltered, uh, uh, un unfiltered opinion, you know, my opinion. I've, I've, I know that I've editorialized, not editorialized, that's not the right word. I've, I've, I've given a couple of my emotional feelings on this issue throughout. Uh, drama Mama is a drama show and I do my best to present the receipts uh, in as unbiased a manner as possible, but sometimes I can't help myself. Oh, fuck, you're right. I gotta read the critical role statement. I gotta read the critical role statement, that's right. We gotta read the critical role statement. Thank you. Oh my God, I completely forgot. Where's my brain? 
Hold on, I got it right here. Uh, there it is. Real quick. From Critical Role, again, easily the most recognizable public-facing D&D-related media. Critical Role has always supported creators and game development in the tabletop space. We stand by our industry peers, as well as anybody who takes a risk in creating a new system or developing an original idea. The beauty of gaming comes from the opportunity to share inclusive, diverse, and compelling stories from a wide spectrum of creators. That's exactly why we launched our own game publishing company a few years ago, because we believe that broadening the field of creators boosts the entire industry. The success we have experienced is thanks to the passion and interest of the greater tabletop community, and we commit to fostering an environment that allows everyone the opportunity to easily share the stories they wish to tell. This is, uh, there's no way about it. it. It's very clear to me that this is a, uh, this is a statement against the OGL. This is a support, this is in support of the original OGL. They are clearly taking a stance. I will say they don't directly call out Wizards of the Coast, but I mean, they have deals with them. Obviously, that would, that would probably put their show under. Legally compelled to not say bad things. It's, those types of things are always very iffy. But yes, non-disparagement and, and stuff like that are, pseudo enforceable basically they can make your life hell usually you can't actually control someone's speech but they can make your, your life hell by making you go to court and shit the ruling class destroys culture itself yes it does so let me let me do that we are going to uh uh we're going to watch a little clip from the legal eagle video here in a second but i want to get my own voice out on this real quick okay which is to say uh uh Capitalism and endless profit seeking destroys everything that you love. Uh, and uh, as creative people all around, we need to get aggressive about the long term, uh, the long term truth of that fact. Uh, an open game license that is still under the control of, of a company like Wizards of the Coast, as we can see, is not safe. Um, hell. Uh, I mean, it, it, I'm hoping that Paizo's will be safe. But what we need to do is we need to be willing to engage in bold forms of, uh, uh, of, of, of proliferation, in actively resisting uh, the, the, the private property model. And it's very difficult to do because sometimes it does put you at great danger. When the entire world is operating on a, on a, a uh, totally private capitalistic model, it can be an incredible risk to do something like publishing a genuinely open source rule set. But it's important. It's, it's genuinely important. Live update, Wizard of the Coast is firing people? What? Turns out the reason why Wizards' responses are tone-deaf and insulting to the community is due to Wizards of the Coast's internal process, ignoring and threatening their own staff while retreating to legal. People are afraid of speaking out because they fear losing their jobs. Where is this from? These statements are being made by executives and legal based on their assumptions of what will appease the community, not by the team who created the game or the tools. When the statement is prepared, it is typically posted almost immediately and suggestions from other staff members regarding potential problems with the statement are not taken into consideration. In fact, providing such feedback is considered hazardous. Numerous employees have reportedly been fired from Wizards of the Coast's D&D division for nothing more than voicing dissenting opinion when asked for it. People are afraid of speaking out because they, they fear losing their jobs the above comment comes directly from a senior wizards of the coast inside source by way of a paraphrasing bot i'm sharing all that i can but understand my priority is the safety of those who are sharing this information which means a lot of checks and a lot of verification more info to come as fast as it is safe holy shit damn they're taking the elon musk approach 
Well, I mean, doesn't that more just speak to what I'm saying? That this is not a company that has the best interest of anyone in the community in mind. This is not a company that is aiming to protect you. This is not a company that is aiming to allow you to thrive. This is not a company that cares about your home brew D and D. They're, they have inherited a product that was made by passionate people and they are simply carving it up. Like a, like a, interestingly, as a little throwback, like Hannibal carving up his latest victim into a meal. They are carving up the community and everyone in it for their own profit. They don't care. They seem to have disdain for the actual fans of the product. And the reason why I opened this drama mama, talking about my personal experience with D&D, &D, is because I want you to understand that D&D, &D, like tabletop gaming as a whole, is a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. It is not, uh, no one makes money from hanging out, having some beers, smoking some weed, and playing some games with their friends. Nobody's making money off of that. People have fun. It's a social endeavor that brings people closer together, that that leads to incredibly fun experiences. It is a, it is a, uh, our artistic endeavor of people creating things that are unique uh, for, uh, for, for their own group of friends. In fact, let me tell you a quick anecdote, okay? The longest game of Dungeons and Dragons that I ever ran Ran, uh, that I ever did, ran as a dungeon master, as a DM, as a game master, was uh, was in was was ran for over a year. I played for over a year of weekly uh, weekly meetups uh, with the same group of people. I wrote a story unique for them. They wrote characters uniquely for me. Uh, we created an incredibly, incredibly amazing. Uh, experience, one that I revisit in my mind constantly, one that has brought me incredible inspiration over the years. Nobody saw that. You all did. I wasn't even close to a streamer at that time. It wasn't broadcasted. It wasn't uh, published as a podcast. It was just a special artistic endeavor for me and my friends. And it was wonderful. And that is something that D&D &D facilitates very well. Not just D&D, &D, but, but the, the general rule set of, of these role-playing games facilitates that sort of experience very well. It is a wonderful experience. It's an experience, like I said, that brings people together. It did for me. I w am proud of what I created and wrote for that group of friends. It was awesome. I still, I still am proud of it to this day. It's one of my proudest works, and it's something I can never show to anybody else because it's a, it, it's a, it's a. Uh, it was, it was something that could only be experienced, and that's something that D and D is great at facilitating. But not, but Wizards of the Coast doesn't give a shit about that. Okay, Wizards of the Coast doesn't care. They see these, they, they look past all of the actual tangible, emotional, physical uh, aspects of their product and they see only the money behind it. They see that you want these things to help you facilitate a good social time with your friends and they want to use that to make you pay them money. This is why they're so bent on destroying the OGL. And it's funny too, because they are making money. They are already making tons of money. Dungeons and Dragons, Magic the Gathering, these are things that they can make money off forever just by creating uh, new content. People will buy it, but they don't want more money. They want all the money. They don't want, uh, they don't want to facilitate a community that's sustainable. They want to take everything they can get so remember that. Remember that whenever they offer you a product, remember that this company especially does not give a single flying fuck about your community, about the community of gamers that made their thing possible. They do not give a single shit about the fact that hundreds of thousands of people over two, over 
two plus decades are the ones that actually made D&D a global phenomenon. It wasn't Wizards of the Coast. Wizards of the Coast did logistics. They published some books. They hired some people to make stuff for them. They didn't make the community happen. The people playing in their living rooms, the people playing at their local game stores, the groups of people coming together and cracking open a 12 pack of soda to share among three tables of people gaming in a loft at a game store. They didn't do that. They don't care about that. They would just as easily stomp that out if it would make them some money. And they will. And they are. So keep that in mind. That's basically my takeaway. It's very clear to me that in this drama, there is, a, there is one party that is totally in the wrong. And that is the ever greedy, ever cruel uh, uh, Wizards of the Coast executives. And I want to be clear about something, okay? I want to be very, very, very clear about something like this, okay? This is not the designer's fault. This is not the writers of the novel's fault. This is not the people who are trying to create the game every day. This is the financial leadership of Wizards of the Coast who have ultimate power. These are people, okay, there's a joke. Um, there's a joke on the magic side of things. Uh, remember how I mentioned how magic has been going through something very similar to what D&D is going through right now? Um, the, 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 the CEO of, uh, or not the CEO, the, the president of Wizards of the Coast used a, used, used pieces of the Wikipedia article to describe Magic the Gathering when asked about Magic the Gathering. The president of Wizards of the Coast just just grabbed something from Wikipedia. This is how little the the leadership, the financial leadership, the people who have ultimate power in the business world know about the products that they're creating. They don't see you as people. They don't even see their products for what they are. All they see them as a dollar sign. They see them as a dollar sign that they could try to make grow bigger or grow smaller. They don't even understand the mechanics. They can't. It's not in their mind to be able to do that. D&D, &D, I already said this once, but I'm going to say it again. D&D &D could not exist without the community, just like magic can't exist without the community. Magic, the, the gathering, a card system, the reason why magic has lasted so long is because of the way that it, the, the way that local game stores are able to basically translate the culture to Wizards of the Coast. But see, Wizards of the Coast in its modern form, now it's always had problems, but especially in its modern form, doesn't know what, what local game stores do. They don't care. They don't know what it does. They want to turn it into a farm that they can farm money out. That's why they want you to buy in to D&D Beyond because that's a farm. It's a rigid farm that they can understand. In the past, local game stores serve a special role. They serve as the ability to basically to, to basically find out what people are actually into. When there's four different sets that launch of Magic the Gathering, but everybody's buying one specific set, the reason that they do that, the reason the, the local game store can go, hey, just so you know, nobody gives a shit about the Walking Dead crossover packs. They all want the, uh, the vampire packs. That's what local game stores can do. Local game stores and the community therein uh, uh, are, are the way that they, that's, that's a, a fundamental aspect of the function of the product. The product doesn't work. Uh, there is no intrinsic value to a bunch of pieces of cardboard. No, no one cares about a bunch of pieces of cardboard. There are 900,000 different card games out there. What matters is why people are having fun with specific versions of it. The cardboard doesn't matter. Okay, it's what people do with it that matters and local game stores are basically the only way that any that, that there can be any understanding of that happening. Corporations can't understand this. There's no way for them to be able to parse that. It's impossible. There needs to be somebody there, a, a local game store who's sitting there talking to people every day about their interests. And of course, that doesn't mean every local game store is good. They're obviously idiots who run local game stores. But local game stores' purpose is that they can, they can, they can curate. They can listen to the people who are spending time playing games in their store, and they can find out what people want to buy. They can find out what's important. 
And of course, Wizards of the Coast doesn't give a shit about any of that. Wizards of the Coast doesn't give a shit about local game stores. They don't give a shit about DMs who are running the campaigns. They don't give a shit about people who are organizing uh, you know, group play. They don't give a shit about any of it. None of it. It's unfortunate. But the good news is, the good news is what we're about to watch which is a cool little legal, legal Eagle video. We're gonna to react to a legal Eagle video that will show you why there's some good news in this whole situation. Okay, so let me bring that up. All right. Let me show you, it's, it's a really good video, okay? It's a short, it's, it's not a super long video, but take a look at this. Here we go, let's watch together. Dragons is ultra oh, by the way, I should explain why this is good news. The reason why this, this particular video is good news is because it explains the legal mechanisms behind all of this. And it explains basically why Wizards of the Coast is completely and totally uh, full of hot air. Okay? Let's listen. The deal. Pray they do not alter it any further. Because for years, Wizards of the Coast, which publishes Dungeons and Dragons, has operated under an open gaming license, an OGL. Don't worry, Delance, it's all good. to create and profit from unofficial content in the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Or does it? It's time to think like a rules lawyer. The idea is that the OGL is a legal framework that allows people to use the rules and ideas of the role-playing games to create their own works. And it was originally released in the year 2000s by Wizards of the Coast. And a lot of people have come to rely on the terms of the OGL to make and publish their own content uh, under the aegis of Wizards of the Coast. But that was version one of the OGL. Now, according to a leak, version 1.1 of the OGL, which has not officially been adopted, so yes, some of this is going to be a, a little bit of a quick summary of what we just went through in depth. Uh, as you can tell, I just want to be clear, the reason why I do long form videos of this is because I want you to be able to have all of the thing to see for yourself all of the stuff that I'm pulling from. This video just does a summary and has links in the comments. It's a very different format. So you're going to hear some things I already talked about. But don't worry about it. It gets to a good point. Opted makes huge sweeping changes that will affect anyone that makes content uh, even related to Dungeons and Dragons. But this leaked version 1.1 update to the OGL is a mixed bag. It purports to crack down on sexist, homophobic, and transphobic content that is created with the Dungeons and Dragons name. It purports to grant a perpetual license to Wizards of the Coast for anyone that makes content using that license. It purports to require certain people who make content uh, using that license to report that usage to Wizards of the Coast. And if you make over $750,000 in revenue, you have to pay certain royalties up to 25% to Wizards of the Coast on certain marginal income. These are big changes. Now, it's important to distinguish the OGL from the actual Dungeons & Dragons rules. The Dungeons & Dragons operates under a set of rules that's up to version 5e at this point, and the OGL is not the Dungeons & Dragons rules, and generally speaking, those rules are found in the system reference document, the SRD. That's a 400-page document containing just about everything you need Need to know about playing D&D. The main benefit of the OGL, whether you're talking about version 1 or version 1.1, is that it allows people to use and reproduce the SRD, the rules. But for people who make content that just simply works with the rules but doesn't reproduce them, well, there's a big question about whether you need the OGL at all. Now, we'll come back to that later. Now, these sweeping changes caused a huge uproar among fans and content creators alike. But like I said, it's a mixed bag. On the plus side, it provides a relatively clear path to allow almost anyone to create officially licensed content and that's pretty rare it's not like disney says sure you can make any mickey mouse content you want just Thanks, pay Kowalski. us if you happen to make over seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in revenue. shoot me an and email if these changes were coming from kowalski shoot me an email uh demon mama online at gmail.com that's the easiest way i can follow up on something like that thank you um a position of absolute restriction like Disney has a lockdown on their IP, then people would probably rejoice that they have this pathway to uh, make officially licensed content and profit from it. But as it stands, we're coming from the opposite. We're coming from a world where almost everything was totally open and these restrictions are causing a lot of consternation. So many people are upset about this leaked modified OGL. And the leaked OGL differentiates between commercial and non-commercial content. People making non-commercial content are fairly unburdened. And the leak says that making money via Patreon doesn't necessarily count as commercial so that probably covers a large swath of people who he's being fair here but as we know uh 
uh, while you while non-commercial stuff isn't a part of the royalty scheme, we do know that in the leaked version, uh, the leaked version of the document, that they wanted to take the rights to it for even non-commercial stuff, uh, uh, in perpetuity, worldwide, sub-licensable, royalty-free. So. I know he's being charitable here, but let's remember that aspect that he doesn't really touch on here. Might otherwise be upset about these changes. Now, I'm not gonna dive too deep into the changes of this OGL. It's reasonably easy to understand to the credit of the lawyers who drafted it. And a lot of the coverage has already described what the implication of these purported changes are. And there are some issues as far as enforceability and promissory estoppel and reliance. Uh, can you revoke a license that was granted in perpetuity? I'm not gonna get into those. For a more detailed breakdown of the contractual provisions themselves, I'd highly recommend you check out the nerds over at Opening Arguments. They really go into the details of what the original and the leaked OGL say and what they don't say. It's absolutely the best breakdown of the contracts themselves. But I also think almost everyone is missing the biggest issue. And what I want to cover today is one of the more fundamental flaws with this whole setup. And I think, frankly, it changes everything. And as it happens, this whole controversy is a perfect opportunity to teach people about the difference between copyright and trademark. So, you know, win-win. <laughs> but the original OGL has been around for a while and it was intended to provide an open platform for players. And for some of the critical background on that history, I turn to the D&D expert and Uber nerd, Matt Koval. The products that they make for Dungeons and Dragons tend um, to sell best to players. Well, adventures don't make a lot of money because only one of the four or five players at the table buy them, but you still gotta make them. So his argument was, why don't we open these rules and make it so that people, anybody can make uh, products for us. And that way, third party companies will come along and they will make adventures for us. And they'll make other stuff too, but we don't care. And that way they'll support our product. And there was also some um, verbiage in there about how, and if those companies improve our rules and it's published under the OGL, then we can take those improvements, right? And then our game will improve. And that was a you know very egalitarian way of looking at things. And then fast forward and Wizards of the Coast releases a fourth edition, which um, was very controversial and alienated a lot of fans. And so they sort of freaked out and released a fifth edition. Fourth edition wasn't released under the open gaming license. It was released under a different license called the GSL, which was much more draconic and restrictive. And then fifth edition was released under the- I like that he called it draconic and not draconian. The term that he meant there was draconian, but it's funny because uh, one of the biggest features of Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition was a dragon race, a uh, the dragonkin, who are draconic. So the theming around Dra Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition was draconic, while the rules were draconian. Ho ho! Uh, uh, under oh, sorry, dragonborn. Dragonborn? Did I say draconic, dra draconic earlier? Oh, I guess I messed that up. Is it Dragonborn? I thought the Dragonborn was from, I thought the Dragonborn was from, from Skyrim. Isn't the Dragonborn from Skyrim? Why did I think it was Dragonkin? Yeah, I know they're in fifth, fifth edition. By the way, well, I did play fourth edition, but I did not like fourth edition, I will say. Anyway, whatever, let's continue. The old OGL, which is much more open and broad and empowers people to make the stuff they want. Privately, the reason Ryan said he wanted to talk the board into opening um, D&D was because he did not like the idea that any one company would control this hobby. Like, he was like, I, I don't think, I think D&D should belong to everybody. And this is the best th way I can think of to make that happen. D&D is, I think, more of a folk tradition and a hobby than it is a classical brand. And it has always relied on the people who play it more so than any other game I can think of, except, you know, perhaps like Skyrim, right, where there's so many mods for it. It's always relied on the audience to create content for it. Things like The Thief come from people playing in Los Angeles and coming up with a new class and literally calling up Gary Gygax on the phone and saying, hey, we got this cool idea. And he's like, oh, that's cool. I'd probably do it like this. And all of a sudden there's a thief in the game. Right. So that relationship between the players and the people making the game has always been a lot more gray and weirdly nuanced than almost any other game I can think of. Okay, so with that background out of the way, let's talk about the difference between copyright and trademark. I promise it will be- This is, this is actually super helpful. 
you all will learn something from this. I promise. I learned I I I learned something from this. Be worth it. Now, copyright is a certain legal protection for expression. When you have an original work of authorship, whether it is a movie or a novel, uh, and you affix it to a tangible medium, well, then copyright will protect that expression. Copyright does not protect ideas. It does not protect processes. It protects expression, whether that expression is in the form of words or a painting or a video. Copyright will provide quite a lot of protection. Okay, does that make sense? So copyright covers pe individual pieces of work. I made this design that is copyrighted. You can't copy that or plagiarize from that thing. Got it? There we go. Trademark is about serving to identify the source of a particular product or service to distinguish that product from uh, other sellers in the marketplace. The idea with trademark is you don't want consumers confused. You want people to actually know what they're buying at the time of sale. And trademark is a little bit different in that it can last forever. As long as someone is actually selling the trademark good, that trademark will continue for the protection of consumers. Now, Dungeons and Dragons as a tabletop RPG product involves both. It contains copyrightable pieces of expression as well as trademarkable elements that are meant to identify it in the marketplace. Uh, let's use a board game uh, that everyone is familiar with, Monopoly, as an example here. The name Monopoly is trademarked. There is a long history of the Monopoly trademark that dealt with years and years of litigation. Let's put it aside for the moment. The logo of Monopoly is also trademarked. The official Monopoly board, the actual squares and everything on it, that's copyrighted. That is expression. It's as if it were a painting. And then sometimes within board games, you have specifically detailed characters that can be copyrighted. For example, in Monopoly, Rich Uncle Pennybags is a copyrighted character. And in Clue, you have Colonel Mustard. Those are copyrighted characters. I'm only a guest. But the name of the game, Monopoly, is trademarked. So you can't go out there and create a game called Monopoly and sell it, even if the rules of the game are completely different. But what about the opposite? What if you created a game that had a different name but followed the same rules as another game? Well, that takes us to the fundamental flaw of this whole entire controversy. This right here is what I was talking about. You're going to understand in just a second why I said this is a this is a bloomer fuel ending to this dreadful drama section. You're going to understand in just a second. Which is that you can't copyright the rules to a game. You can't copyright a process. Now, this goes back to an extremely old copyright Supreme Court case uh, in the late 19th century called Baker versus Selden, where someone tried to copyright a particular method of bookkeeping. In that case, a guy created a method of bookkeeping, i.e. accounting, uh, and published a book about it. The book did okay, but it really took off when another person created another book of basically just forms that used the same methodology, but didn't credit the original person. The original author sued, but the Supreme Court said that there was no copyright available because you can't copyright a method. And that idea was later codified in the Copyright Act of 1976, which said, quote, in no case does copyright protection for an original work of authorship extend to any idea, procedure, process, system, method of operation, concept, principle, or discovery, regardless of the form in which it is described, explained, illustrated, or embodied in such work. So for example, if you wondered why everyone could play the game Words with Friends on Facebook, even though it was an exact clone of Scrabble, well, that's the reason. Scrabble can't have copyright protection over the rules of the game. It can only really get trademark protection over the name Scrabble, not the rules contained therein. Now, there is a little bit of a wrinkle here in the sense that if you had a manual of rules, you do get a thin copyright over the exact expression over the rules as laid out do you remember I mentioned this earlier? I, I, I mentioned this specifically because I didn't know this until I watched this video. Uh, that like the, 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 the way that the rules are written uh, uh, can, be, can be copyrighted, but you can just change the wording. The rules themselves are not able to be copyrighted in that rule book. However, you don't get a copyright over the rules and processes themselves. So in a sense, you can have something that has exactly the same mechanics, the same processes. Uh, it just can't necessarily have the exact same expression if you were to reproduce the rules perfectly. But that's kind of a minor quibble. Exactly, so how does this Gurna. relate to the Wizards of the Coast update to the OGL? Well, I think, and I could be wrong, that Wizards of the Coast is assuming that 
Anytime anyone creates any content that happens to use the rules of Dungeons and Dragons that is covered by the OGL. I don't think that's the case. Now, this is not legal advice. Your mileage may vary, but as we discussed, you can't copyright the rules. You can't copyright the methodology and processes. And that takes us to the thing that no one is talking about. Here's part of the secret. The original OGL kind of sucks, and here's why. The main benefit of the OGL was that it allowed people to include the SRD, the system reference document, in their material. If your material doesn't require a reprinting or quoting of the SRD or the 5E rules, then you probably don't need the OGL. The original OGL allowed people to use what it called, quote, open game content, meaning, quote, the game mechanic and includes the methods, procedures, processes, and routines to the extent such content does not embody the product identity. Now, it did not allow people to use, quote, product identity, meaning, quote, product and product line names, logos, identifying marks, including trade dress, artifacts, creatures, characteristics, stories, storylines, plots, thematic elements, dialogue, incidents, language, artwork, symbols, designs, etc. See, what he's saying here is that you never needed the OGL to begin with. The OGL, as I said at the very beginning of this entire drama mama, was a a spiritual uh, uh was a spiritual event it was a it was an event meant to encourage people to calm their fears to make to encourage them to have trust that that you could make things freely without getting sued it was meant to dispel concerns and to to stimulate therefore creativity and it worked etc 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 so based on what we've already discussed here I'm not sure that there was much benefit to the original OGL. It mainly allowed you to use stuff that you were already allowed to use, unless you wanted to actually quote the expression that was found in the SRD itself. And the new OGL does basically the same thing. The leaked OGL allows licensed people to use, quote, licensed content. It says, usable D&D content, quote, licensed content. This is Dungeons & Dragons content that is included in the SRD version 5.1, including basic game mechanics, a curated selection of classes, monster spells, and items that allow you to make content compatible with Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. And then the new OGL goes on to say, not usable D&D content, quote, unlicensed content. This is Dungeons & Dragons content that has been or later will be produced as official, that is, released by Wizards of the Coast or any of its predecessors or successors, and is not present in the SRD version 5.1. Unlicensed content includes things like the most famous Dungeons & Dragons monsters, characters, magic spells, and things related to the various settings used in Dungeons & Dragons official content over the years. What the old open licensed content referred to as, quote, product ID. Identity. So both OGLs purported to let you use game mechanics of Dungeons and & Dragons, and in my view, that's stuff that everyone was always allowed to use. But of course, the benefit of the OGLs, whether it's version 1 or version 1.1, is that it provides certainty. So there's that. But let's differentiate between two different types of content. In one bucket, you'll have what I'll call reproduction content. And in the other bucket, you have what I would call homebrew content. In this first reproduction bucket, you have things that would probably be considered from a copyright perspective Botnite says, wouldn't this be kind of like if the people who created Doom created a license that would then let people make first person shooters? Yeah, actually, I don't I don't know if that's 100% analogous, but that's pretty damn close. That's pretty close to what's going on here. Um, that that's, that's basically, again, like he said, it provided certainty. It was an emotional thing. It was meant to make sure that, I mean, guys, this is part of the thing that we talk about all the time, that capitalism discourages creativity because the only people who can be, who can feel safe and be reasonably comfortable in certain types of creativity are people who already have a lawyer or people who have the money to deal with shit like this. Part of the reason why people never embark on, on certain endeavors is because they know that people get sued by companies all the time, that there are copyright trolls, many of them out there. You guys remember Remember, you guys remember when uh, when fucking uh, 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 King King was was suing people over the name that their game that they invented and copyrighted and trademarked that was called Scrolls. Do you guys remember when they were trying to sue companies for any like they were just sending out cease and desist letters uh, like a shotgun to anybody who used the word scroll in anything? You guys remember that? 
Now, none of that would have held up in court. What it's intended to do is it's intended to basically discourage people from ever doing the thing in the first place. It's a way of aggressively defending their, their property even when it's not a legal claim that they're making. You can't go to prison for being wrong about a cease and desist. You can go to prison for di for being wrong when you disobey a cease and desist. So see, our system as we have it, our economic system is slanted in the favor of those with the money to do things like aggressively defend their uh, defend their IP. Oh, it was Zenimax? Sorry, uh, my bad. It was Zenimax. I thought it was King. My 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 bad. Oh, it was, oh, it was Saga. It was Candy Crush that did the word Saga. Scrolls was Zenimax. Sorry, I got it mixed up. Derivative works, that is, works that are based on a copyrighted property that Wizards of the Coast owns. So, for example, if you made a t-shirt that features a character that is based on an official Wizards of the Coast Dungeons and Dragons campaign, and you put that on a t-shirt, even if you paint it yourself, well, that's probably a derivative work. And you need to get the permission of Wizards of the Coast. And to their credit, Wizards of the Coast has a fan art policy that allows fans to create fan art. And this is on their website, and I don't think it's changed. But also in this bucket is stuff that reproduces the SRD. Remember I said that they do have a copyright over the actual exact wording that's in the SRD. And recall that both the original OGL and version 1.1 allow people to reproduce the SRD. So if your livelihood relies on actually reproducing the expression of the SRD, you would need to abide by the terms of the OGL. And I don't think that has changed. And maybe you want to quote large sections of the SRD to put it into a reference manual, or maybe you want to put the entire SRD into a PDF along with your original content. Say if you created an entirely new set of rules, but it starts with a basis of the SRD and you don't want to have people referencing back to the old SRD. Well, that is probably covered. And to their credit, both versions of the OGL allows people to do that if you want to quote the SRD. It creates a pathway for that. But this reproductive bucket consists of things that are based on things that Wizards of the Coast can actually copyright. In the second bucket, and this is the thing that I think most people are upset about, would be uh, homebrewed adventures and campaigns whose only connection to Wizards of the Coast is the fact that they use the rules in Dungeons and Dragons 5e. In this bucket, I'm kind of thinking about the things that you see on Critical Role or Dimension 20, where they create a campaign that is 100% original. The characters are completely new. The settings are completely new. And the only connection that these campaigns have to Dungeons and Dragons and Wizards of the Coast is that they rely on the rules that are set out in Dungeons and Dragons 5e. As we discussed, I don't think Wizards of the Coast has much protection over the rules themselves, the processes and, and methodologies contained in the Dungeons and Dragons rules. So if you create an otherwise nope, original we're about to do campaign, that in Midwest. where the only connection is the fact that it uses the rules that are set out in D&D 5e, I don't think that runs afoul of the OGL. In fact, I don't think you need permission from Wizards of the Coast in any case. Even if you videotape and live stream that campaign, I don't think you need their permission because at the end of the day, Wizards of the Coast doesn't really have uh, any kind of IP protection over the rules themselves. Now, admittedly, there's a lot of gray area here because it's not as simple as one bucket for fan art and one bucket for homebrew. Wizards of the Coast in D&D has all kinds of different characters. Some are pre-made. Now, arguably, those characters are often in the service of the mechanics of the game. They define the strength or speed or dexterity of these particular characters. But there's also backstory there. So does that create the kind of character that is protected like Colonel Mustard or James Bond? Or is that simply a rule in the game that functions within that rule-based universe? That's a tough question. But I'm also skeptical that the changes to the OGL uh, affect virtual tabletops or Kickstarters as well. Again, the virtual tabletops are basically using the mechanics of the rules themselves, which I don't think Wizards of the Coast has much protection over. And same with Kickstarters over original campaigns and adventures. You know, again, if you're creating an entirely original world that just simply happens to use the rules of Dungeons Remember what I was talking about, about the Kickstarters? Do you remember what I said about how aggressively Wizards of the Coast seem to be targeting Kickstarters? 
That's because they know that most Kickstarters are made with small teams. They know that they can intimidate these people to just agreeing to pay, regardless of whether they could actually sue you or not. You see, the crazy thing is, even if they can't sue you, if they convince you to pay them, there's nothing that there's like you agreed to pay them. Even if you did so because you were scared you might get sued, it doesn't matter. That's why this is such a dirty tactic. This whole thing is the dirtiest tactic in the world. It is a giant fuck you to the community in the name of making more money by the most manipulative tactics imaginable. And dragons. I'm not sure that there's uh, much that Wizards of the Coast can do about that. Uh, though, at the same time, if you are trying to do a Kickstarter over something that- Big mafia moves? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It does, it does have mafia-esque feelings too, doesn't it? Also, A Causality says, it hurts my brain trying to comprehend legal logic. It doesn't seem logical, or at least it's too complicated. Legal logic is not logical. Legal logic is built, le the logic of legality is built entirely off of, uh, off of, of, of societal norms that have been inherited. The legal logic is, is so screwed up. It does, there is no actual internal logic. It's, it's, it's all feels, but it's feels that have been endorsed by state powers. This is why you end up with um, with lawyers who are highly logical people, nonetheless defending Christian laws that were pub that were written into the law, you know, a hundred years ago, and some of them still remain. Yeah. Anyway, it's very twisted. It's not. It's not logical. It's not actually logical. Wizards of the Coast actually has protection over. If you wanted to crowdsource a movie based on uh, the mythos and, and lore of Dungeons and Dragons, that probably is going to be covered by the OGL. Though another gray area where I'm not sure where a court would come down would be, say, live streaming a playthrough of an official Wizards of the Coast Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Obviously, Wizards of the Coast publishes a number of official Dungeons and Dragons campaigns. And if you live streamed you and your friends playing through that, that is you using official Dungeons and Dragons content over which they do have the copyright, that's a tough call. Though I would say that's analogous to live streaming a playthrough of a video game, which is also kind of a gray area. A video game is copyrighted. And it's an open question whether your playing through it is adding enough original content to be covered by fair use. In the same- It is. It absolutely is. I would go for playing through a Dungeons and Dragons official campaign. Though I do think that is a separate question from the kind of fully original homebrew type of situation that we were just talking about. Now, if you are a big player in the space like Critical Role or Dimension 20, there might be some true advantages to making sure that everything is officially licensed by Wizards of the Coast and they might not be able to Smash Widget says, the implicit threat of the new OGL is that they're going to sue anyone who doesn't agree into oblivion. And I'm afraid they're gonna do that anyways, even if people move to the ORC, since they're making the new OGL retroactive. Uh, I imagine that there will be some people who will be essentially forced out of business because of the way that uh, Wizards of the Coast is going to pursue this shit. However, in, in an actual court of law, I am not a lawyer, but from what I can tell, they would get obliterated. Uh, uh, Wizards of the Coast, in my opinion, I am not a lawyer, but in my personal opinion as Demon Mama, is doing this purely as an emotional threat. They have no actual grounding for any of the things that they're claiming. They might be able to claim certain aspects of copyright, but it is the, the general OGL 1.1 is a bunch of pseudo legal garbage that is mostly meant to consolidate power via threats and nothing more. Yeah. And yes, exactly. As A Causality said, the threat of lawsuit is, is what ha is, it always hangs above, and that's what matters. Small players can't compete even if they've done no wrong. They will avoid a lawsuit by stopping what they're doing. That's what the goal of this shit is. You avoid it. And certainly, if you are going to create your homebrews that are not officially licensed, you can't say that they are officially licensed, and you probably can't use the name Dungeons and Dragons, except in a nominative or descriptive fair use way, in the sense that you might be able to say something like, this campaign is compatible with Dungeons and Dragons, uh, because even with trademark restrictions, you can describe a thing by its official name, but you're likely to be able to compare stuff and say that this is compatible with the rules of Dungeons and Dragons. You're just not allowed to say that this is from Dungeons and Dragons or somehow officially licensed. Anyway, that's just a theory, a game uh, legal theory. And 
of course, the situation has now changed. Wizards of the Coast released a statement on D&D Beyond. All right, we went over this part. All right, that's that's everything that we wanted to. I already went over this part. We're not going to listen to Legal Eagle go over it, too. Uh, he doesn't really add anything to this particular part of it. Uh, that was Legal Eagle, uh, a really tiny but good uh, YouTube channel. You know, not as not as prolific and famous as I am, of course, uh, but very helpful on describing why you should hoist your ba your black flag and recognize your 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 skull and crossbones and recognize that you never needed the OGL in the first place. Uh, that said, we can all acknowledge that what Wizards of the Coast is aiming to do here is nothing short of the most trust-destroying, cynical uh, nonsense that you could possibly imagine. It is nothing but a, mo a, a cheap money grab, a cut-throated gesture towards the community that made their product viable.